Hey everybody, welcome to the Arborist Blueprint podcast. Uh, thanks for joining me here on this three-part series I'm doing with Sean Sterna on how to become a contract climber. Sean Sterna is a highly educated and experienced guy. I think you guys are going to really like him. He's a leader in the uh, arboriculture industry. He's a trainer with Arboriculture Canada, an assistant trainer like myself. He's a fire captain, does a lot of leadership type things. Uh, he's a rope access technician, and uh, but I mean, his career is a contract climbing arborist. So we're going to go through a whole bunch of stuff with him. In episode one, uh, we're going to talk about uh, why you should be a contract climbing arborist and the differences between that and having a tree company, uh, some of the expectations of you as a contract climber, some prerequisites, um, having the confidence to get out there versus having some imposter syndrome, your responsibilities versus the crew, of course, and uh, day-to-day experiences, that kind of thing. So we're really going to get into it with Sean there. Uh, and then episodes two and three, we're going to be covering the business plan and how to find work, marketing, uh, marketing yourself and uh, creating a bit of a brand, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to jump into this career and you don't know where to start, that's going to be a great episode for you. And then in episode three, uh, we're going to talk about some lessons learned, uh, a little bit of stuff about rescue, how to set yourself up to be safe, some new ideas in the future of uh, this career. I also have some great ideas I want to share in there about how to kind of rethink about being a contract climbing arborist, uh, how we're approaching it, and maybe how we could do it a bit better. So we'll see what Sean thinks about that. Uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, I'm Kurt the Arborist. You can find me on Instagram. I own my own tree company, Cochrane Tree Care. It's a small tree company. run a pickup truck and a trailer. And we serve our local community. Uh, it's great. I really love it. I have a background in uh, some permaculture as well. I love uh, tree health, pruning, and all that kind of side of things. Whereas Sean, who we're talking to, um, he's a real gear guy, so he knows all the stats about different gear, different climbing systems. Uh, it's what he really enjoys teaching, that sort of thing. So we kind of contrast each other in that way. I used to be a firefighter EMT as well, like Sean, for 16 years, and I got out of that uh, due to some mental health, PTSD, that sort of thing, and then reinvented myself uh, as an arborist and ultimately started my own company quite early in that journey. So I have a lot of experience uh, there with the startup um, as well as, you know, some photography businesses and different things in the, in the past before that, um, that I can, I can lend some insight on. We've found, especially through our discussions that a lot of experiences we all have in the past definitely overlap. And there's a lot of transferable skills, um, that, that do, um, relate to, you know, even becoming an arborist or starting your own business and all these things. And ultimately it comes down to communication, uh, and that sort of thing, which we're going to get into. Uh, if you don't know, uh, shameless plug. Got these shirts on, wear them in most of the podcasts, uh, Atmos Tree, check it out, boom. Um, I just recently founded Atmos Tree and I've been working super hard on that. So you'll probably hear some updates of what's going on there in some of these podcasts, but I don't intend to uh, be advertising it like crazy on here or anything. But just so you know, um, you can follow me there as well. It's at Atmos Tree Org or just visit the website um, that's on Instagram. And basically, Atmos Tree is a regenerative alliance for arborists. So if you own an arborist company or you're a contract climber, you could join Atmos Tree and uh, you would charge a small recycling fee to clients that have a tree removal or to the principal arborist if you're a contract climber. And then Atmos Tree takes those funds and we invest in planting two trees. So it's a two to one tree cycle program. Uh, we're trying to replace all of these trees and make this commitment together to ultimately get more trees in the ground. So it costs arborists uh, nothing because all of it is funded through these recycling fees. And uh, we're going to be planting all over the world, initially focusing on some more local plantings, kind of where I'm from, so I can get my handle on uh, becoming a forester or civiculture or whatever you want to call it. But I'm going to be incorporating a lot of permaculture practice there too, working with alliance members and planting uh, near their areas, but also planting abroad um, in developing countries where people can benefit from harvesting things from the trees, all sorts of stuff. There's, there's tons going on. It's so awesome. Free to join, free to maintain your membership. Uh, we create all this branding, uh, decals for your trucks that say tree cycle on them, logos for your website, all that kind of stuff. It's meant to be a big collaborative effort between all of us. I have everything uh, set up to make it as easy as possible for you to just slip in. I just need a little bit of your information and uh, I'll mail you out some decals. And I even have like line items and stuff you can just plug right into your quotes and invoices. Uh, super slick. And we, we take in the funds quarterly and uh, providing lots of updates and uh, reports and of course taking your ideas on how we can make it better because we're we're in this together and i want it to be literally an alliance it's not me just deciding everything so but if you want to just sit back and uh, charge recycling fees and not put any work in and not take advantage of the branding material that's totally cool too 
So, uh, you know, take advantage of it how you will. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll get to the podcast. So thanks for joining us. This will be uh, episode one, and uh, we'll come back. Episode two and three will be released at a later time. Okay, enjoy. Thanks. Arborist Blueprint Podcast. <laughs> Well, thanks for uh, coming on. Um, I'll throw a little intro, which I'm sure if everyone's listening has already heard about kind of what we're going into today. But uh, let's give them a quick overview again before we uh, get into a little intro. But uh, it's a three-part series uh, on how to become a contract climbing arborist from our points of view, of course, which I think are valuable. Um, but I want to go through in the first episode why be a contract climber versus starting a traditional tree company you know, benefits versus negatives, maybe some prerequisites, uh, for your training versus, uh, experience. Maybe you should have some equipment, like the minimum amount of equipment versus some specialty stuff, which you can probably speak on a lot because you are the equipment gear guy. Yeah. Um, gear nerd, yeah, gear nerd. That's, that's for sure. Um, maybe some of your expectations from your experience, cause I'm not a contract climber, but I have my own tree company and I've considered it. So I can lend my point of view and definitely ask you some genuine questions around it. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, some of your expectations versus what was reality, what really was it like compared to what you thought it'd be like, um, totally. yeah, yeah, maybe talk about some of like what the crew's experience usually is, um, your responsibilities versus what a crew's responsibilities would be. Um, you know, having that confidence versus imposter syndrome. I made a note about that. Uh, I know I struggle with that sometimes, you know, you, you're not confident in what you know, and uh, are kind of scared to get out there and maybe push the limits or make that leap. But I uh, got to give yourself some credit, of course, for what you do mm -hmm. know, or, or be realistic about what you don't know, too. So we can get into that. And then uh, a usual day to day breakdown of kind of what what it's like for you start to finish. And uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that. And then episode two and three, we'll get into more stuff about uh, like a business plan and finding work once you want to make that leap into being a contract climber. And, uh, the third one, I want to go into some lessons. Maybe you've learned some new ideas, the future of contract climbing, that kind of stuff. So yeah, for yeah, sure. Thanks. Sounds awesome. Yeah, buddy. Well, thanks for joining me. Why don't, uh, you tell everyone who you are. So we know it's like, it's legit coming from the Sean here. The Rocky yeah. Mountain Arborist. The Rocky Mountain Arborist. Yeah. So my name is Sean Sterna. Uh, the Rocky Mountain Arborist. Uh, kind of been in residential arboriculture now for probably about nine to ten years. Uh, I come from a background of kind of forestry. Uh, started off kind of early, mid-teens, kind of getting into the forestry industry, uh, starting into that avenue of climbing, forestry climbing and, and chainsaw work. Oh, they did um, climbing and forestry? <sighs> climbing. And... and <laughs> I got to be careful here because I'm okay. not I'm not discounting the style of climbing. It's just very different from what we're used to and what we sort of teach to within residential arboriculture. Okay, and, um, and forestry to me like is pretty broad. Like I don't mm -hmm. can you just go an overall of what forestry is and what you did in forestry? Because yeah, honestly, so I, predominantly I think I would know harvesting. More, but... Uh, harvesting fur was kind of predominantly what I was involved in. Um, so the harvesting for logging industry, wood mill, stuff like that. Um, so 99% of it is just falling because there's not a whole lot of targets out in the wilderness. Um, but then every once in a while you end up with hazard snags, stuff like that, uh, that you would end up climbing. Okay. And so that's where you uh, kind of come in. That'd be tricky. Yeah. So it's, it's totally different. I didn't do a whole lot of it. I was quite young at the time, but my exposure to climbing was you have you know your lineman's belt essentially there really wasn't much padding to it just an old school leather weaver or something like that right uh, Buck and and Billy had, Ray style yeah totally and you had your <laughs> scare strap and the scare strap was something you'd throw around the tree if you were scared so you'd have oh, your spurs geez. and you'd climb up so no one would use the bark of the tree and then you might throw your scare strap around to cut kind of thing. well you'd have to to cut uh, but your rope was hanging off the back of your saddle. And if you really needed to repel, you'd pull your rope off and you'd unravel it, tie a Blake's hitch to come down. And so when we talk about things like egress and we talk about things like, you know, rescue plans and all that, that we kind of preach to within residential arboriculture, none of that existed. Um, and oh not necessarily that it's worse. Uh, yeah. It's a totally different application, right? You're out in the bush by yourself. You're up 160, 170 foot trees. Uh, it's, it's a different beast. And okay. so 
Okay. That was kind of my background into it. And then, uh, so I, I'm with the volunteer fire department in our neck of the woods. Uh, I joined that about 12 years ago and through that met somebody who's like a third generation residential arborist kind of thing. Oh, cool. And uh, Sean's in Bragg Creek, Alberta, by the yeah. way. Beautiful yep. place. Gorgeous. Yeah. Foothills right on the, the gateway to the foothills in the Rocky mountains. So nice. we're kind of spoiled, but, uh, but yeah, so we, uh, kind of met him through the fire department and he's a big arborist and and was doing kind of his own side gigs on the weekend as most kind of arborists tend to fall into uh, fire, firefighters in general always have a second career path 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah for sure you know that mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh so yeah he asked me to come out on weekends and so i've got a big background in rock climbing and and rope rescue and kind of everything to do with rope stuff uh, and yep. he's like hey come run ropes for me on the weekend I, I do some rigging and need somebody to run ropes that's that's competent cool uh, so started running ropes for him and then got into climbing and then slowly started to find out all the things that i didn't know about residential mm. climbing uh, and ended up getting involved a little bit with arbor canada and taking some of their programs and again okay. learning more that i just didn't have any clue of and what are some of the first courses you took down, there just curious uh the very first course i took with arbor canada was probably actually i think it was probably hazard danger was probably oh, yeah. the first nice. one i did just because that's how it fell Maybe. into their calendar yeah. uh and then i took ttfc and then got into modern tree climbing uh aerial rescue all those types of things so cool um, and again at that point i'd kind of as a lot of climbers do, right? You you fall down the YouTube rabbit hole and you're you're learning what you can from YouTube or social media and stuff like that. And some of it's really good and some of it's maybe not so good. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so having the opportunity, actually, you, uh, your first guest there, Johnny, was one of my first instructors in, in tree climbing and stuff like that for like, too. actual proper tree climbing. Yeah. Uh, so Johnny and Neil and, and taking them, them taking me through a bunch of stuff and it's kind of like... Okay, I gotta do some homework here. Yeah, uh, yeah, and just kind of a lot of self study and a lot of kind of picking out what I could over the years, and and here we are, kind of thing. So sweet, yeah. I remember seeing yeah. you. I think it was a uh, hazard danger tree. I was just yeah. helping assist Neil. That was like my one of my first courses yeah. helping I think assist. You were coming out and taking photos or something like that, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I could have been. Could have been doing that too for sure. I think I wasn't helping him out. Which means I probably you know stood around and was listening intently to because uh, <laughs> some of the courses I took with them to uh, um, were, were training, but I came and I did photography. Yeah, you know, f in exchange for uh, for kind of sitting in on the course to learn some stuff. So I was kind of you know half in and out because I'm also paying attention when I'm doing some photos and stuff, is which makes it a little bit tricky. But uh, I retained you know sixty percent of it. <laughs> well, that's that's pretty good. I mean, yeah, that's but good that wasn't that long numbers. ago that you were. You know, even in that course, and then I recognize right away seeing you. I'm like, okay, different mindset. This guy's a leader. You can tell he's got some experience, obviously from the firefighting and whatever. Um, really personable, great guy to get along with. You're really authentic. You know, didn't have that chip on your shoulder, awesome or anything. So mm. I remember thinking right away, like, this guy's got to take train the trainer with Arboriculture Canada because he's going to be a great trainer. And then I think you were you signed up like later that that next year or. Yeah. No. It. Uh... It was probably two years after my first program. Um, so the, I did my first programs and then that next year for train the trainer, I had what I had something going on and I couldn't make it and I can't remember what it was. Um, but yeah, then the year after that, I, I definitely jumped into train the trainer. Weren't so. you going to Hawaii or something? No, it wasn't Hawaii. It might've been, uh, I don't know. It was October. So I don't, I don't remember where I would have been. But I had something on the go. Yeah. That was, that was like three years ago, two years ago. <laughs> That's great. So then you were, uh, so now you're an assistant instructor with Arb Culture <laughs> Canada. Yep. Uh, fire Rescue Captain uh, in, in Redwood Meadows. Yep. Right, Bright Creek area there. Yep, 100%. Um, and then you got into some rope access. And I know we're going to touch on this in some future episodes here that we do about how people can diversify and become a contract climber, but also find some other work, maybe if they're seasonal or just to kind of overlap those uh, experiences into something else to earn money. Totally, yeah. But maybe you could touch on that quickly, just some of that stuff you do, like rope access and, yeah, uh, yeah go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's one of the, the kind of things I love about the contract climbing environment and something that we'll probably end up chatting about in a little bit more detail is it gives you the opportunities to diversify uh, and, and do a lot of variety in your kind of day-to-day. -day. I mean, I... I 
I've worked the the nine to five. You walk in the door, you know exactly what you're expected to do through the day. And it's the same thing day after day after day. And it's just, it's not for me. I, mm-hmm. I like variety. I like challenge. I like to have a little bit of, of you know, spice in the day, if you will. Spice. So having the ability to diversify and do a couple different things is, is super exciting. So kind of got involved in rope access uh, and so do, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, but I do a fair amount of, of rope access stuff. Um, you know, atrium and picking up, envelopes. right? It seems like you're doing more yeah. of that now, but, and even yeah. like last night you said you were out on uh, some emergency call. Yeah, we, well, I uh, got a bit of an emergency call from a property management, uh, property manager. Uh, they had a water leak 13 floors up in an atrium space that they can't get to. Uh, soaking the drywall so they weren't sure if the drywall was structurally sound if the drywall was going to fall because it's so saturated Uh, so our primary mission they basically called us up and said hey we need you here like asap our primary mission was just to gain access to that space through rope access techniques to assess if the drywall was structurally sound and then once we found out restoration company call you then like do they call an emergency like the fire department or they call a restoration company and then it goes to a company you contract for more or less yeah yeah so this particular property management company has a long-term like construction maintenance contract with one of the main providers for construction services uh, and they ended up reaching out to us to kind of facilitate this but uh yeah so once we figured out it was sound then it was just the investigation game to figure out where the leak is coming from so uh, kind of odd stuff like that, but it's kind of interesting because it's it's totally different from what you're dealing with from a tree perspective. Uh, and it's kind yeah. of interesting as well because we talk a lot about the the contrast between rope access and arboriculture. And in arboriculture, we don't have rated acre points. You know, I've never dusted off a, a union of a branch and seen 16 kilonewtons stamped on the oh, branch. Oh, in Cochrane, they got ratings on them. Do they? That was, yeah, must on the north side yourself. of the tree, you just pull it back and it's got a little <laughs> little metal sticker plate on in there it. someone's yeah tagged by a QR care. code yeah yeah exactly but uh so we always talk about like oh our bar culture we don't have rated acres we don't have these things but a lot of the times in rope access like we didn't have necessarily rated anchor points we we're having to use our best judgment and the knowledge that we have and what we know about the building structure to find suitable anchor points that are going to be efficient for us or, or effective for us and so I think you start to talk about that dichotomy and, and the big thing is really deflection. And we can get into this when we start to talk about the diversity of where you can sure. go, but uh, there, it really is a, is a challenging environment. It's not just, you know, cut and paste the way some people might think of it as, oh, there's that engineered right. anchor point, you clip to it and you repel and go up and down. And there's a lot of different, different things you can get into. So uh, a lot of challenge there as well. Cool. But uh, yeah, that's kind of... You know, I enjoy having that option to, to challenge myself and do a couple different avenues of things. So, yeah, it's awesome. pretty exciting. And then how long you've, have you been contract climbing officially for? So officially full-time, probably about two years now. So this will be my third year of kind of official contract climbing. Okay. Um, What's full-time to you? Is that uh, like a seasonal five less, days a week? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's never five days a week with contract climbing. Um, and that's kind of, you know, we talk about the expectations versus reality and, yeah. and the reality is it's never always like a five day a week thing. Yeah. Um, I guess if you're, any if you're the type job. of person that looks at your calendar and you're like, Hey, I need to have, you know, two weeks booked out in advance every day for two weeks kind of thing. The reality is it doesn't often work that way. Right. Yeah, it's give and take benefits, I guess, for, I mean, having your own business, right, is the benefit is that you can schedule your time off and around other personal things. Yep. But you're also at the whim of whoever's going to hire you, whether it's a client or in your case, a a principal contracting arborist company. So if they don't need you, they don't have to fire you. They just don't call you. Totally. Yep. Yep. (laughs) Well, and the reality of that environment too is, is I mean, you mentioned being able to plan like time off and family time and all this type of thing. And, and the reality of contract climbing is you don't always get that opportunity. I mean, you can certainly just not answer the phone or you can tell people, yeah. hey, I'm gone for a month. Don't call me. But the reality is we've got the busy season from yep. like spring until fall. The reality is if you want to make a good go of it, you're pretty much at the whim of a company. And they might call yeah. you that morning and say, "Hey, we need you out here today. We got we weren't sure about this, and now we're looking at it. We can't do it." Right. Uh, 
you kind of got to call somebody else because I think we're going to get into this too. But ultimately, it's like building these relationships with these companies so they know yep. you and they trust you. Not just to be safe and everything, but it's it's easy for them. They don't have to go f search and find somebody, and you know they suck at it or take way too long or whatever it is. Hundred percent. You want someone yep. that's that's like ready to go. And available and then if you become unavailable then it's like oh god then they might just discover somebody else and then you call yeah. you less yep. and who knows but so yeah why, yeah i mean uh, the, the kind of the kicker to all that and and you know something that we've talked a lot of folks have talked a fair amount about um through the social medias and stuff like that i mean the the key to contract climbing is not necessarily to come in knowing all of the tips and tricks and be the most flashy and elaborate person it's about efficiency mm. and and the moment that your customers the folks that you work with the other tree care companies start to realize that they can bring you in on non-technical like regular kind of run-of-the-mill jobs maybe they've booked themselves like too thin over the next two weeks you can come in and, and show efficiency and you know, double their production, what they would normally be able to do in a day, then that's that's kind of the, the niche right there, right? I mean, yes, right. there's always room for the flashy technical stuff, but yeah, the reality is how much of that actually happens on a day to day basis. And, you know, it's it's not as prevalent as as some folks might think when they're like, yeah, I'm gonna be a contract climber, I'm gonna show up for the awesome stuff. And I'm only gonna rig crazy trees and do all this cool things. Yeah. Well, some of it is just the fact that you're super efficient. And you can get that tree done that they could do, but you can do right. it twice as fast. So they make twice as much kind of thing, right? Yeah, and I guess you got to put yourself, it would help at least to put yourself in that mindset of how you can be of benefit to them. Like, what are mm -hmm. they looking for? And they're going to totally. want someone that's ultimately going to help them earn more money yep. and keep them safe, right? Yeah. And yep. uh, maybe provide some leadership, all these kinds of extras uh, that a contract climber on site could do. So if you can offer those things, you're going to be highly attractive to them and probably easily find work mm -hmm. um so why did you decide to contract climb versus start a tree company or did you ever consider that or do you just kind of fall into it or why do you think anyone out there you know starting out would want to consider one versus the other or or maybe start a tree company and then transition over you know that sort of thing yeah so i think the the biggest thing for me um so i ended up getting involved fairly heavily uh with uh, a good friend of mine's kind of tree care company uh, and ended up there was a period of time we had a big windstorm come through and, and big storm work and all sorts of stuff and he was away on another kind of job opportunity he kind of took the winter off to focus okay. on that oh was so that kind of uh, tree works no no that's that's tree works is out of bright creek as well uh but no this was this is uh my neighbor two doors down so red mountain rigging oh okay uh, and so i kind of fell into sort of managing that uh sort of day-to-day -day stuff and now you're starting to worry about all your chipper maintenance you're worrying about you know truck maintenance you're worrying about all the saws and all the things all the crew the you know bits and pieces that the crew need the gear right uh, and to me it was kind of your day isn't just the tree job you don't just show up and deal with the tree now all of a sudden you're coming home and you're swapping chipper blades or you're moving things around and well guess what now you move the chipper blade and the anvil's not the right height so now you got to adjust the anvil height and there's all this other stuff that goes into it that to me was kind of the unattractive part of it like i like the problem solving and i like the engagement with people and homeowners and and you lose a little bit of that with the contract climbing. I mean, certainly as the full service tree care company, you get a lot more of that contact with the homeowner. You get the opportunity to educate right. all of that side of things. Um, but part of what I really find kind of exciting about the contract climbing is I don't have to worry about the maintenance stuff. I mean, I still have my saws and I have you yeah. know, my equipment that I maintain, but that's, I mean, that's not that troublesome to me. But I, I get... I get contact and I get education and I get the opportunity to connect with the client, like the, the, the company owners that I work for and the staff and the crews that I work for. And that ends up coming back around to the homeowner kind of indirectly. And now the homeowner's hiring that contractor or recommending that contractor. And then they bring me back in. And it's so I'm still finding that connection through kind of maybe a more convoluted means. But yeah. And usually when you're on site, if you're the guy in the tree, everyone in the neighborhood staring at you <laughs> totally. that guy oh my god what's he doing so 
they usually come over and have to, you know, so you get a ton of the positive interactions, I bet, with people that come over and they, they come to you 100%. first and they're like, man, I saw you in that tree. It's so awesome. So you kind of like, you get that, but you don't have to follow up with the email of like, hey, reminder, pay your invoice. Well, exactly. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. I mean, you still get some of that with some of the clients, but that's just reality, right? They have to yeah. wait until they get paid from the customer to, to pay you. So it's, it's not a, a huge issue, but I think the big thing for me is, is, I I did a lot of years in kind of people management uh, and managerial roles, running a group of anywhere from thirty to sixty people, which in is not necessary. Or, uh... No, in a completely different environment, uh, okay. kind of property management and and security and emergency management stuff, and uh, different from a tree care service because you know. You, in reality, if you run a tight crew of a tree care service, you got two, three folks that you work with and that's it. But the the reality of it is, is your decisions and your, I guess, scheduling and, and thought process affects other people. Yeah. And to me, it's like I didn't want to have to worry about the work I was providing to other people if I wanted to take some time away with the family or do whatever. I wanted the opportunity to just kind of, you know, this week we're going away or this week I'm going to go skiing or this week I'm going to do whatever without having to necessarily worry about lining stuff up for the other crew and make sure that they're making a living and, you know, yeah. worrying about all of that side of things. Um, it allows opportunity. I, I totally yeah. align with this. Um, even though I have my own tree company and I'm not a contract climber, so I may have a little less freedom, but at least I set up my tree company, Cochrane and Tree Care um, to, well, I mean, it's things, you know, do grow and I fall into my own traps, but ideally I try not to schedule Fridays, for example, or even for a while there, I wasn't scheduling Mondays and Fridays mm -hmm. because you have to leave time to, you know, do everything else, be with your family, whatever exercise, yeah. whatever it is you're into hobbies, keep that balance in your brain. But when you have the free time and the spare time, it allows you to be creative and come up with new ideas and, and go after those new opportunities, you know, set up those zoom calls with a new connection or whatever it might be. And I think that's probably why you've been able to diversify into rope access and leadership and stuff through the fire department. And if that's what you enjoy, then you, you kind of need to make that happen. And that's what I've done as well, as best I can so far as trying to leave that time open. Now I feel like I'm being stretched in kind of all over the place, but I, I'm really loving it though, still for now. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was a, that was a good, uh, good point for sure. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the key to it all is, is, I mean, I have, I kind of pride myself on all of the different avenues that I'm able to work in and experience and, and that stuff that I don't think I'd be able to do as efficiently or, or even at all if I was running a crew of people with equipment and all the rest of it. Um, you really do kind of become dedicated to it. And I mean, the, the upside to that is, is like there's stuff, there's people will contact me and say, Hey, you know, maybe they're a friend of a friend or whatever. I got this tree. Can you help me take it down, take care of it? And it's like, yeah, I can help you get it down. But like, I don't have a chipper. I don't, I mean, yeah. I've got a tiny little brush trailer if I'm doing like pruning for friends and family, but it's like, I, I can't handle yeah. a massive tree on my own for removals right. or doing all these other types of things. So, but inevitably, uh, it does limit you that guy. way. You get they, they're going to ask you, right? So you have yep. the gear. I, yep. I love your truck setup too. We're going to get into that a bit, but um, you know, you can just have a small personal vehicle with your tools in there and you can just go and then, yep. yeah, they have the chipper, they have the truck and you can go and help and then you can leave uh, whenever you guys have agreed upon. But yeah, you have neighbors, I'm sure you have friends, people get to know you through teaching at Abora Culture Canada and, mm -hmm. yep. or, or, I mean, Bright Creek where you're from, like I've been called out there a bunch of times because they're just overwhelmed when, when winds come through, the trees are falling down and they need someone yeah. to cut a tree so you must be doing some tree work independently then like i know you would normally probably charge your principal contractor your contract rate but you you must go to other people's houses then and, and give them a quote and do tree work independently especially if they're, they're like hey just get this tree down make it safe they're all you know everybody's i got my own chainsaw don't worry i could do this if i wanted to but i just you know those kind of totally so yeah. do you do a lot of those job like do you seek those out or do you just wait till they happen or yeah i don't i don't seek it out um i kind of organically it, it happens right okay. i mean it's just word of mouth and and uh i don't 
I don't know, shameless plug here. I don't show up. I mean, you mentioned the truck. I don't show up with a truck that's all deckled up for Rocky Mountain Arborist. I'm not. Except I'm not about tree adver- Well, I got Atmos tree deckles. That's for sure. <laughs> Atmos tree is a different beast. Yeah. But uh, like, I don't Sorry. come. I don't come up to kind of. I don't show up to take over the advertising of the company that's there. Uh, yeah. Like yeah. I don't. But or, I mean, just organically, word of mouth things happen. I get phone calls, and and they want me to come in and deal with the situation, and. So my, the way I usually handle it, if it's, you know, close friends or family and it's something small that, you know, I can handle my tiny little brush trailer, then fine. I'll just come out, usually little prunes, you know, uh, a buddy had a willow that he wanted some pruning done, just lifted it up off the, the lawn yeah. a little bit, stuff like that, whatever. I can do that. Um, but typically if it's something that is an involved process, it requires ground crew, it requires assistance, stuff like that. Uh, sometimes really rarely I'll make some phone calls and bring some folks in. Uh, but typically I look at the location of it. Uh, I look at the companies that I do a lot of frequent work with and I kind of pass that on to them, that contact onto them. Nice. Well, that's and, good. It's like a collaborative effort get, then that yeah, way. Yeah. Cause they get root density out of it. And if they want to have me come in and assist, then great. But, yep. uh, ultimately the more business they're doing and the better, the more they're succeeding than the more they're calling me and all these types yeah. of things. So uh, well, that's great. Yeah. And we're going to get into that in uh, episode two, actually talking about some hybrid business styles. So it may not be what you do, but we could talk about how people can expand and still do contract climbing, but still have 100%. a little outfit, you know, like me maybe because mine's yeah. pretty slick and uh, uh, has a lot of freedom just running a smaller truck and doing a lot of stuff independently, but high speed. High speed. The high speed operation. Yep. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> high speed of our culture. Yeah. So, uh, prerequisites. What do you think? I mean, looking back now and seeing other people out there, what do you think you need as far as some minimum or preferred training officially versus amount of experience that you would need? Like, can someone jump into this brand new and start out right away as a as a climber after taking a few mm-hmm. courses or what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of an interesting beast. Uh, I mean, we, we talk a lot amongst, you know, some of the ARBCAN folks, Johnny, Neil, yourself. Uh, we talk about this concept of there being really no barriers to entry to arboriculture. I yeah, mean, which if, could be good and bad, obviously. Yeah, yeah, you've got a pickup truck and a chainsaw. Guess what? Now you're a tree service. What's um, up, Cock and Tree Care? <laughs> I got a trailer too, yo. Well, there you go. See, you're already a step up. <laughs> so don't let but that think, deter you, um, folks. Yeah, exactly. No, I'm not. Not <laughs> no. I know. I'm just bugging. I'm just bugging you. Hey, but I'm I, I'm much the same background, right? I mean, it's it's. I did a little bit of mentorship with uh, with like, like I said, this third gen arborist. Uh, but this third generation arborist, his main job was with a production oriented tree care company one of the massive ones with like 20,000 yeah. employees across North America uh, and so when you've got 20,000 employees working for you even something as you know standard from our perspective of a hitch climber yeah. try and distribute a hitch mm. cord and a pulley and all of the equipment you require to 20,000 climbers across North America yeah all of a sudden that becomes prohibitive right you know what this and reminds so, me of mm. is when I worked on the ambulance, especially, yep. right? You have a medical director who's got to be in charge of, you know, his own butt because he's telling everybody, he's writing the protocols of what to do for everyone yep. on the ambulance and got a massive, you know, whatever. It could be even Alberta Health Services, like the whole province. But for me, back when I did it, it was like, say, the city of Edmonton. And he's got to think about, you know, it sounds bad, but like I always always say, they write this stuff for like the dumbest person that's going to work there so they don't screw it up, right? So if you totally. can think outside yeah. the box and do more, it's kind of like you're held back. It's like, because they got to come up with some sort of plan or structure where they're not going to be there to hold your hand so that you can, everyone can employ it, not just the smartest people. So like getting back to your point with the tree service, that's like you work for a big massive company. There might be all of a sudden that kind of stuff in place of like, you have to do this and you have to have this certification to do this. Totally. And again, yep. that's the good and bad that kind of thing with having that regulation um that you can kind of go through a bit of a process and you can feel a little safer and have a bit of a structure in mind for the future but ultimately you're not allowed to be as free thinking or come up with new creative uh ways to do something which is kind of more of like the fire and the rescue side where you just get a whole whack of tools and it's like okay go figure it out we don't know what's going to happen right like last night for you the roof's leaking we you know what go guys you guys got to do it yep 
Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And so I think it's it's you know it's kind of an interesting point you make with regards to thinking outside the box. And and I mean, if you're looking at sort of the the hierarchy and the prerequisites to get into contract climbing, I think the foundations of large tree care companies are great. I think that gives you a wonderful stepping stone and a base platform. It was certainly kind of where I built my Especially platform. Especially when you're new and you don't know anything. It's 100%. 100%. The, the biggest, I guess, prerequisite that I would say is having the ability to open your mind to something new. Don't become pigeonholed into, you know, they showed me that this is the way, that's the way. Uh, to have that drive to pursue exactly what you're talking about, thinking outside the box and finding different ways to solve challenges that aren't just the standard that's been shown to you. Right. And and that's kind of the drive, the mental piece that you need to have to really push into contract climbing. And you've had that mindset for a long time, it sounds like, because what you do is, and similar to me is, or other entrepreneurs, you you have an experience in life, a job in the past or some sort of relationship and you, you learn something from that person or that organization and you kind of pick and choose what you like. You're like, this didn't work. Now I know mm -hmm. and this worked. You take that tool and you add it to your other ones and then you get this whole web of experiences that you can then combine in the future to create something. And this could be creating your new contract climbing business or how you're going to do it or how you're going to approach it. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 a myriad of experiences coming together, right? It's it's you don't have to have 25 years swinging from ropes in a tree to do this. You just have to have the ability to like you're saying, find those experiences from other areas and and mesh them together. Yeah. I mean, it's it's I've had this conversation with Johnny actually quite quite frequently and and it's I will be the first person to admit that my path through this industry has been about as accelerated as you can possibly find. Yeah. Uh, and, and I attribute a lot of that to various experiences from other industries that yeah. I'm able to bring together. And, you know, there's, hey, this one time in this rope rescue environment, we rigged in this particular way and it created this particular vector and solved this problem of a swing <clears throat> in this direction. Yeah. Why don't I apply that here? Uh, and it's it's being able to to use those different experiences in your life and apply them to whatever's in front of you, whether right. it's a tree or whatever else you're doing at the time, you know, rope access, rescue, doesn't really matter. And we both had that similar um, accelerated experience, like with me getting into boriculture, I think I was around 35. So I had some life experience and maturity, mm -hmm. some experience like you working uh, as a career firefighter, EMT doing some rescue, not a lot of rope stuff, but I did like some forest firefighting, whatever. So I took all of these skills in the past, which helped me identify for one, that I, I was going to enjoy a boar culture and climbing and being in trees and using chainsaws and that kind of stuff. Um, Cause I think it takes, take a certain personality, but if someone already knows they like it, um, that's huge, obviously. But um, maybe someone, what do you think about someone coming in brand new? You got a, you got a young guy, he's thinking about being a tree guy. Maybe he's Maybe he's a groundsman somewhere, has mm -hmm. this dream. He wants to be the climber. The company doesn't want to let him climb. He wants to go off on his own, whatever it might be. So they're not as fortunate as us as far as having some of that background experience. Where would you say they should start? Yeah, it's tough because if you're in an environment where a company has kind of pigeonholed you into being kind of ground crew and they're not going to let you get up in the tree, it's a tough environment, right? Uh, I mean, I was incredibly fortunate to have just at the right times in my kind of evolution and introduction to the industry, having the right mentors. And I think that's mm. really important is mentors find is somebody that you can, that you can mentor from and kind of latch onto them. Uh, and, and that might be other contract climbers. Um, I've got a couple folks that have kind of reached out to me and say, Hey, like, I just want to come out and, and, take this in and learn some stuff. Can you mentor me? Stuff like that. And they don't get that opportunity on every job, but when you do get yeah. the opportunity, you know, other contract climbers out there, I, I do encourage you to go down that path. I mean, there's this belief that, well, I'm training my replacement and they're just not going to call me anymore. They'll call this new person. But the reality is, you know, the more you can build the industry and the more you can create the next generation, the better off you're going to feel and the, actually the more work that's going to bring to you because yeah. those folks are now going to call you when they're not quite sure about something and all the rest of it. So, yeah, um, we got to get to this think, mindset of, of competition, I think, yeah, too, and this 100%. really helps and just trust it. At least from my experience lately, it's really helped 
you know, stop thinking like, oh, there's more tree guys around in the community. What am I going to do? How am I going to compete them? Why are they here? And like, I don't want to bring this person with me because they're going to learn to be a better arborist than me. And they're going to leave and start their own business and take, it's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we just got to open the mindset to more collaboration, right? And, and maybe helping these people, being honest, authentic. And then I feel like when you're giving and helping other people because you've had that experience. I mean, that's how we learned from other people, other mentors. 100%. Um, they're going to learn as well. And good things are just going to come to you. I honestly do believe that. And it works out. Maybe they go off somewhere else and then you guys end up working together later on. I don't know. You, you can't predict what's going to happen, but I definitely do trust in that flow in life in general. And it's really helped me out with business mm -hmm. uh, life in general. I also wanted to make another uh, point just to support your, um, your point there about having a, a mentor. 100% agree. Johnny was my mentor in the beginning. I met him day one of that Aboriculture Canada course, production tree removal rigging. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you just got to be the squeaky wheel. Like, I mean, if you are new and you have the desire and you want to do this, you really will stand out. I thought I thought everyone was like me and they're all asking for, for something and needing help. And it's like, because Johnny would be like, yeah, anybody who wants to come down and, and be part of a, a tree job one day, check it out. Always, you know, here's my Instagram, write me. But I think I was one of like two people that ever wrote and, you know, and the other guy showed up for one day and that was it. But I, I kept in there and I kept following up with him and then you build a relationship. And then before you know it, you've gone out and you've done multiple tree jobs, you know, and for free, oftentimes when you're new, you kind of have to give more than you can get mm -hmm. um, because you're getting some of that training and mentorship in exchange for 100%. your time, Yep. Um, which I think is extremely valuable. Education is extremely valuable. So. That might be what you have to give. Maybe they will pay you. I don't know. Like oftentimes a lot of guys, if they're good and you're a good person, will pay you a groundsman fee or something just to be around. So yep. you can kind of pick and choose and then you can jump from um, maybe a few different companies is what I would recommend. And I tried to do, I tried to do a little bit with Davey, a little bit with another guy, just kind of felt it out different size companies and see how they're all kind of running things. Just take in everything, what they're doing, ask lots of questions if they're willing to answer and, uh, and then maybe follow up with a few courses would you recommend after getting a mentor or 100 percent, yeah uh, i think there's there's the nice thing about courses and and you know regardless of where you go well i shouldn't say that because there's obviously there's better courses than others um but the nice thing about courses is you're bringing in such a diverse experience level and you go to say a tree climbing course it's not all brand new climbers it's not all a-list climbers you've got this mm -hmm this myriad of experience levels and the nice thing about that is is you're able to learn from all of them mm. and and again it comes back to that that mindset right of being open towards other experiences and and finding ways to think outside the box because there's going to be questions that the new climbers ask that you never thought about yeah. and you're like you know what every single time i go to a course i learn something and i learn something from every single individual i learn something from the brand new folks i learn something from the folks that have been doing it for 20 years everybody in between i'm always learning something from them yeah and you, and it you might may just have something to offer to them question. too like if you have a brand new totally. perspective they're just like oh i've never yep. thought of it that way i've been doing it the whole way yeah same way my whole life yep um i'd also like to add I know when I started going to some of those Aboriculture Canada courses, I felt so intimidated because I didn't know anything. And I'm like, these guys are so hardcore. And even people in the in the course were like, you know, they had chainsaw pants on. And I was like, oh, my God, I don't <laughs> yeah. even have chainsaw yeah. pants. Um, but everyone was really good. Like, no one had a chip on their shoulder. Um, everyone was really honest about what, you know, they didn't know. And they were afraid to ask, like dumb questions you know what you would, people would call dumb questions like people would just be totally open and honest and yeah and i i felt that really good like even guys that were already working for a few years as arborists are just like hey how do i do this and it wasn't like oh my god you've been spurring trees pruning for the last three years like no no like no one was There's judging no us. Judgment. it's like, it's like yep. okay um there are some better ways to do things but, totally yeah but it was it was a great environment and uh yeah so i would recommend training for its people as well the one that comes to mind is the that modern tree climbing obviously is a, is a pretty obvious systems, yeah. choice yep. um of course we're biased to Aboriculture canada because we're both assistant instructors there but i think it's a great uh, private school a lot of charismatic instructors there um and a lot of, yeah. and you can ask questions beyond the course too like i learned a ton beyond because i needed i needed all the information i could get so i i was just non-stop i was i was the time vampire as we call it 
<laughs> it's good. It's squeaky good. wheel. The squeaky wheel. No, I think it's it's you know, and and again, kind of your concept or your thought process of of you know getting out into an environment where you can ask the questions and where it's very supportive and and one of the things again to kind of toot you know bias with both you and I being involved in Arbor Culture Canada but the environment that those courses create is honestly I've been in so many training programs I've been in so many different industries so many different training suppliers like it's the environment that you get your learning environment in Arbor Culture Canada is literally second to none it's uh it's truly supportive and the connections you're going to make are going to go a huge way in paving that way towards where you want to get in the industry, whether it's contract the, climbing, yeah. plant health care, you know, wherever you want to get to. You don't know where you're, what you don't know yet too. Hundred like, I didn't know 100%. I was going to love tree health and soil and permaculture. And I thought I was just going to be a freaking chainsaw cut, tree cutting down guy, you know, and, and, totally. which I, is fun too, but. And now look at you. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, right. Yeah, you, I mean, you never I, know. I, I do encourage. I encourage training programs. I do encourage the Arboriculture Canada program simply because of a the instructor base that they utilize and b the supportive learning environment. And exactly what you said. I mean, it's it's. I always put my information, my contact information up at the end of a course. I know all of the other instructors do, and hardly anybody takes advantage of it. We don't just put it there to have it, you know, out there. We actually do encourage people to contact us because I had the opportunity to contact my instructors, Johnny, Neil, all these folks, after I took a course and ask questions and learn, continuously learn from them. Yeah. So now it's 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 the ripples, right? You put those ripples out, they're coming back to you. And so now is my opportunity to stand on the shoulders of those that come before me and yeah. do the same, right? Be yeah. that mentor, contact, or whatever those people need. So. Yeah, get involved in training. Uh, I can't say enough about the Arboriculture Canada programs and so, certainly get the contact information for your instructors and, and reach out, right? Yeah, and Ask why not questions. try and use them as mentors? Because you already know their instructors, exactly. you already know they're experienced, yep. and they're they're good at communicating that information to students. So they yep. would be a great pool of people to ask to be your mentor, if if possible. Or maybe let's meet somebody else in the class as well that, that runs a decent uh, tree company. If you're looking for a job, you know, it's a great way to make connections too, because it's it's easier to find a job with someone if you know them and they have a face they can put to your name instead of just firing resumes, obviously. Totally. Um, okay, so maybe just a quick, let's just list off a few courses that might be good for someone who's getting into it new, but the obviously the modern tree climbing would be great. Yeah, modern um, tree climbing systems is a great one. Uh, production tree removal and rigging is a great one. Right, which is, uh, if anyone doesn't know, spur climbing, basically... <laughs> Basically, it teaches you to like yeah. to, to trim the branches off of a tree like a spruce, cut the top, rig it, rig the. So you learn some rigging, you learn some yep. spur climbing. Learn some spur climbing, you learn some some negative block rigging. Uh, so you're starting to talk about the vectors and bending moment and all these different forces that we need to understand, especially when you start to get into running your own tree care company or being the head climber of a tree care company or a contract climber or whatever yeah. your role is. They might be relying on you to you, know that stuff. Exactly. Uh, so we get into a lot of the forces and the vectors and all that type of stuff. Uh, those are two really good ones. You can start to get into the technical tree felling and cutting and the hazard danger stuff. Uh, ground based, mm. not climbing based, but yep. the skills that you're going to learn and the, the cutting styles and the techniques and mechanical advantage and all that is applicable to everything you're going to do aloft in the tree as well. Okay, uh, I got a quick so question two, for you. Yeah. Do you ever show up to a job where they've, they've hired you to climb and you get there and you're just like, I can just fell yeah. this tree? Often. Or I can yeah. throw a rope in it and guy line it. Like, yeah. So you don't even have to climb. Like, Or are, are you ever afraid to do that because they hire you to climb and they have this expectation? Like, do you think guys, out, no. I'm sure there are people out there that go there and they'll just climb the tree without thinking outside the box like we were talking yeah, about. Yeah, potentially. And, and a lot of times I don't have any, what's the word? I don't have any reservations about doing that um, simply because... I don't necessarily view myself as a climber, like just climbing. That's a great way to think about 90 it. Ninety percent of what I do is climb, mm -hmm. but the reality is, I'm there to help guide them through the process of getting this tree onto the ground safely, right. or pruned safely, or provide a different set of eyes, different exactly. range of experience. Yep. Whatever they need, right? So yep. you're kind of an all all encompassing 
well, and everyone could be different. Everyone's going to bring different experiences, different climbers. But for you, they know they're going to get a good leader, maybe some instruction. Yeah. They can ask you questions and, that's and just a skilled it. climber, like every, everything, right? Yep. If I could show up to a job site and it's like, you know what? Really, we could crank this tree back this way. And we had one the other day, a storm damaged tree just around the corner that I jumped in with a local company on. Uh, and the thought process, we were going to have to climb this, rig a block, do all these things. Uh, and you show up and it's like, well, hey, we could actually shoot a line, guy line it back this way using a GRCS or a rotary winch or something like that, get it kind of up out of the other tree and then utilize standard hazard danger felling techniques. And we don't have to climb. We're done in half the time. But now you yeah. get the opportunity to educate. And that's what I really enjoy doing is now this crew is like, we don't care if he's climbing or not. We're getting the opportunity to see something that we didn't think about. Now it's like, yeah, yeah. we've got this in our toolbox for next time, right? And yeah, and ultimately, so, if you can train them to do it safely on on their own, that's great. Yeah. You can just move on somewhere else. And now you've your ripple effect has affected all these other guys now that are that are more interested in it. They're being safer at their job. Hundred percent. You know, yep. it's, it's a win win for everybody, in my yep. opinion. And, and you're going to get work. It's not like you're going to you drive yourself out of work and be homeless or something by doing no, this so no let's no. let's get out of that mindset but yeah exactly um as far as experience um maybe we should touch on that real quick before we mm -hmm. move on to some equipment because i want to come back to uh the grcs and your your homemade shenanigans that we got going on there 100 <laughs> percent, which is awesome um so we got some training we got maybe you know three or four courses throughout the year yep the board culture canada maybe we found a mentor um we're doing some days here and there with them um, maybe outside of actually finding a tree job, maybe you can find a company with someone that you do connect with and like, and you, maybe you do have to start out as a groundsman. Um, but you can still observe a lot. And of course, again, you're a squeaky wheel. You're asking lots of questions. Inevitably, I wouldn't doubt you're going to get experience then sent up the tree to go and try it out. 100%. Maybe you can borrow equipment or start obtaining some of your equipment on your own outside of, uh, outside of work and go and do some recreational climbing and some of these trees just getting used to the feeling of keeping your hips closer to the tree and setting mm -hmm. lines and doing whatever like if you have the ambition and you're going out there and doing this i think you can really accelerate your own path even if you don't come from a background like we have but i would i'm just going by feel here but i'm thinking you know if you had a one good year of of training and you went hard with all this kind of stuff yep um you know, and this also includes learning a bit about tree biology and all, because you might be hired to climb to, to prune a tree, or maybe you'll get there and say, this tree doesn't need to come down, like whatever it's sick with, it doesn't 100%. need to, and yep. you should be an advocate for trees as well. So yep. you need a well-rounded experience, but I would say at least after a year, maybe you could start working with some companies doing some basic tree climbing. Would you yeah, think? Yeah, for or sure. I think it's, it's to to truly be the guy that gets the phone call or the gal that gets the phone call uh you you really do need to be really efficient in the tree you have to have efficient movement you can't get up there and kind of bumble your way around you have to have efficiency in moving in the tree because yeah. it's the reality is it does cost a company more to bring you in than to do it themselves because they're paying so, by the hour right usually bingo. yep yep yeah we're going to yep. talk about that too uh as I think in the next episode about a little bit about that, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, so they're, they're on a time crunch. Yeah. <laughs> they may have so quoted the it's... job at one price, but you're getting paid by the hour. So ideally they'd exactly. have you done as soon as possible. Exactly. Yep. So, I so think your it's, performance it's does matter. Huge. Oh yeah. Your performance really does matter. hundred percent. It does. Which adds pressure. Uh, it, it can. Yeah. Yeah. And we can talk about that a little bit too. When we start to talk about expectations and reality of, of the client mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. customer that's brought you in to climb for them um, and how you can go about educating them to make sure that you guys are on the same page. But I think from an experience perspective to kind of directly answer that question, there's not necessarily a, a number that I would assign to it yeah. because it completely depends on what your environment is for learning, what type of experience you're getting, who you're able to mentor under, all these types of things. Uh, I mean, you could have a, a super rapid accelerated growth towards contract climber and being the ninja in the tree that does everything. Or, right. you know, it might take you five, six, seven, ten years to get that level of efficiency and experience to, to do those things. So, so um, that is like the confidence versus imposter syndrome, but we can kind mm -hmm. of segue into that a little bit. Mm-hmm. 
but I think you you ultimately like you were saying we can't put a time limit on this kind of stuff. We need to ask no. ourselves and know ourselves whether we can do this. So you have to kind of go by a little bit of a gut feel. You know, be honest with yourself. What experience do you have? Can you do this? Do you feel comfortable up there in the tree? Do you feel like you could lead some of these people? Could you get out of some sticky situations? You're going to you're going to be called to some technical stuff, I would imagine at times. Yep. At least in, in my head. I was thinking like, oh, I can't be a contract climber for a long time because I'm like, I don't know how to deal with a lot of this kind of stuff and I don't want to show up and not know what I'm doing. But then I do see videos of, of you or other climbers and they're just, you know, taking down healthy spruce trees every day. And I'm like, well, that seems pretty easy. I could probably do that at least. So, you know, how do you know when you fit in, right? That's, mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, you're not going into it too cocky thinking you're ready, but you know, what do you think? Yeah, so it, it's, I mean, the the reality of of the environment that I work in and some of the companies I work in being in Bragg Creek area and the foothills, uh, we have, and you and I have actually talked about this uh, prior as well. We have a lot of, you know, kind of your point about the healthy spruce tree. We have a lot of spruce trees that have pretty extensive interior rot mm. and they look super healthy because the cambium is intact. They're still transferring nutrients up and down the tree, et cetera. Um, so a lot of it is don't believe everything you see on Instagram. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit more technical than yeah. it might seem. But I met I mean, Neil. I met Neil. He's out there. <laughs> taking down healthy spruce trees. Just no, taking I mean, down healthy, super easy to climb spruce trees. You know what? The Just reality, kidding, Neil. <laughs> honestly, though, like that's that's a big part of contract climbing. I mean, we like to believe that as contract climbers, we're only going to be doing the crazy technical rigging stuff, you know, advanced things, winches, multiple lines, you know, skate blocks, tension lines, all this type of different stuff. But the reality is a big portion of the work you're going to do is simply a company has so much on their plate, they need help. And if they bring you in, they can be twice as efficient. So yes, a big part of it is climbing I don't necessarily want to say healthy trees, but it's it's climbing easy to climb trees and you're tossing tops out and you're just branching and delimbing and doing all these types of things. Uh, but the key is that you're able to do it more efficiently than another individual. And that's why they bring you in. Right. But I think from, you know, as far as, as the technical side of things, um, I don't know. I mean, it's it's you need to be able to to problem solve. And that's the big one. And and right. When you talk about that confidence versus that imposter syndrome, I mean, it's it's definitely something that I certainly struggle with. I mean, especially with my kind of accelerated growth through the industry, uh, the reality is there's folks that have been doing this for 20 years that are like absolute ninjas. And I'm yeah. trying to, I, I don't want to say hold myself on a pedestal, but I'm trying to present that I have some experience and I have some knowledge yeah. that can assist in the industry the way they are. And so that's, it's definitely front of mind. And that One is a of, lot of people's perceptions, right? That yeah. you have this many years on your resume yep. and you've, you've gone to this school for this type of industry and you have this certification and those things are all great. I don't discount those, but that doesn't mean that there isn't someone who may be a lot less time on that job, um, who could bring in some other experience or may have learned on their own or through different avenues that could be better at that at that job or that position than someone else who has all those accreditations and, and whatever. So 100%. I think that's only one option, but just people's mindset in general from the way we're all brought up is like, you gotta go to school, then you gotta get good marks so you can go to university and then you gotta get that degree. Yep. And then that degree is gonna earn you more money. It's gonna make you smart because you have this behind your name. And it's like, yeah. that's that's one way, but that's all, you know what I mean? It's That's not the only way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the biggest thing as far as, as confidence goes, it's, it's, there's some humility that needs to come with it as well. And there's, there's environments where I may call somebody else to just say, Hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? And they're like, yeah, you know what? That sounds perfect. Or yeah. Did you think about this? Like I still do that to this day. And I, I would challenge any kind of contract climber out there to say that they don't at some point mm. ask for another point of view or another set of eyes. Call um, a friend. Yeah. I, yeah. I still do that less and less, but I mean, I have you and I have Johnny and I have FaceTime. Yep. You know, FaceTime I've, is I've literally used FaceTime is in a storm before. 
Holy yeah. man. Okay. Yeah. So have you ever been to a job where you've, uh, you know, abandoned or put on hold because you were just like, uh, you know, I don't feel comfortable. I've, I've never abandoned a job. Uh, I have put a job on hold for various situations, environmental concerns, uh, you know, for whatever reason that day is just, there's something weird about the day. And, and as long as you're honest and upfront, I mean, sure the customer at the, the company that you're contracting to may at first be like, well, what the heck? But the reality is yeah. if you're able to explain yourself and articulate what's going on and show that you have a plan and maybe, you know, the wind is blowing in a, just a weird direction and it's going to make rigging this more difficult or there's some other sort of environmental situation. We'll talk about this in, in episode three a little bit about some of those close calls and stuff like that. Um, being able to have those frank conversations and to be open and honest and upfront about it mm -hmm. uh, goes a long way in the long run. Because I've certainly been in situations where it's like, no, I've been brought in to do this and the wind is howling in my face and this is going to be a fight to get this broken, oh, totally ugly, totally hazardous top to go the way I want it to. But guess what? They brought me in to do it. I'm doing it. Uh, and it can cause some issues, right? So it's yeah. it's having the humility to look at things and like I say, I've never I've never looked at a tree and said, you know what, I just I have no idea. I cannot do this. I usually have some level of of thought as to how we can handle this. Yeah. I may make a phone call to just ask a second opinion. Um, but the reality is there's a lot of other factors that go into these big technical removals. Uh, and it could be, you know, maybe school nearby is in that day and there's just a whole bunch of kids around. It's like, hey, do you think maybe we could come back and do this on Friday when school's yeah. out at noon instead and, and handle that? Or yeah, for me, it's usually wind. Environmental concern. Yeah, wind is a huge one in our I don't area. know. There's probably lots of trees that I've done too that are, but I mean, I have this luxury because of my own business, but it can yeah. just be gusty wind and I just... I just, I'm scared. I don't feel good in the tree. Yep. 100%. And I'm like, shit, I don't know. My gut's just telling me like not to do it. So I go home with my tail between my legs and I come the next day and it's not windy and it's like, no problem. 100%. Yeah. I'm like, wow. Okay. Well, even just confidence boosting and getting that, you know, prefrontal cortex to re-engage, not having that fight or flight on me when I'm trying to work, like I'm more efficient the next day when I could just calm yeah. out, chill, rethink about things, step back. Yeah. Well, and, and, and your your point about tail between your legs, I think that's something that, you know, kind of to, to address that, I think there's one of the challenges within the industry and contract climbing, owning your own business, whatever the case may be, there's this thought that goes into the fact that this is my tree, I need to handle this, I got to get this down today. Uh, and, you know, it's it's... There are times where I've climbed into a tree and whatever environmental conditions or things are going on that day, maybe it's just the way the tree moves halfway up that, you know, is not, it doesn't jive with how the tree is sitting at the bottom. So I know that there's some sort of structural weakness in it. Whatever the case may be, having the ability in your mind to say, hey, let's take a break. Let's reconsider our options. It might be coming back tomorrow when there's no wind. It might yeah. be, this isn't safe to get this high. Let's rethink rigging off of various other areas. Uh, I don't necessarily, I, I would challenge people not to think of that as having your tail between your legs. Because to me, that's listening to the voice in your head that's saying, not necessarily you can't do this or you don't yeah. have the skill or you don't have the confidence, or but it's gut, like yeah. something's going on today. Yep. let's take a breather, let's reevaluate because yeah. the last thing we want to do is push ourselves into an environment where now we're becoming the next statistic, right? I mean, this yeah. is the most dangerous thing we can do for money short of deploying overseas and getting shot at. So, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, and I guess I should say, you know, if you do feel like you have your tail between your legs and, you know, less of a arborist or whatever the emotions might be around that, like, I would say mm -hmm. to a degree that's it's normal. Almost think of it as like, it's not you producing that. That's just what happened from the situation. It's a normal human response. But once you can recognize that that's happening, just realize that's what it is for what it is. Oh, I'm, I'm yep. feeling afraid. I'm feeling down. I'm feeling scared. I don't know what to do. Overwhelmed. It's like, okay, cool. Great. You know, that's what's happening. You know, it's easier to say than actually do without practice. But 
then maybe you go home and you uh, reevaluate. You go to the gym, you get some good sleep, you come back, you look at it with fresh eyes, and it's like, oh my god, it's just so much easier. Or you can call somebody for help in the meantime. You know, you could, maybe you need a crane truck, maybe you need some different equipment. I don't know. Totally, but, yeah, hundred percent. But it, it is hard to think outside the box sometimes when you are a bit. Um, pressured and feeling a bit afraid and the wind's gusting hard and it's just like too many factors right that's where that's yeah. where your gut probably pops up and says hey let's let's look at something else let's, here let's let's reevaluate which yeah, i sure. made me think of one other course too that we could throw in there was uh the that if you don't have the experience already but a tree risk uh assessment course or a qualification Huge. course because yeah um you are going to be put in those situations and the crew may not even know that the tree has a different kind of risk because they're not as experienced, right? They're, they're hiring contract climbers, people that come in and be these leaders and, and have this set of eyes to, uh, to determine, they're assuming you're, you know it's going to be safe before you do it or safe mm -hmm. enough when you evaluate the risk. So these courses too can help you identify, uh, you know, issues in the soil or cracking and what kind of cracks are, are good or bad. And 100%, you yeah. know, or maybe you need to rig the tree up to secure it a certain to a certain degree before you climb in it like anchor the tree like different yeah. things like that right so yeah well and i think it's it's that point is so pivotal and and to just kind of emphasize it i think it's you know there's this everybody wants to talk about the sexy side of contract climbing you know climbing so and rigging sexy. and doing all this cool ninja stuff <laughs> But the reality is, is you really do need to be a very well-rounded individual with experience in a lot of different areas of tree care. Uh, and, and you've said it, right? Like understanding of, of you know, plant health care, understanding of knowing what to look for in trees as far as tree risk, deformities, structural issues, diseases and insects. You know, there's some insects and diseases that may not cause detrimental harm to the tree. Maybe it's just, a, you know, a... a visionary or a visionary thing can't even think of the word but uh, it affects the visualization of the tree yes. but it doesn't yeah it's not going to cause structural damage uh, more so having yeah, the ability to recognize superficial it. thank yeah. you that's the word aesthetic i couldn't think of it you're welcome uh, yeah aesthetic like it's going to affect the aesthetics <laughs> of the tree but it's not structural it's so like having the ability to rec yeah recognize oh these God. types of things right yeah um, but yeah which, which, like plant health care tree risk, all these types of things. I mean, it's, yeah. there's been situations where I've actually been hired to come in and either remove a tree or mm -hmm. prune a tree. And I get up into the tree and I find something. And, and I can think of a couple where it's like, Hey, I need you to come in and just prune this tree up away from the roadway and do this and that and whatnot. And you get up there and maybe you need to install some cabling to help structure and support things. Or maybe you get up there and this one particular one had a massive co-dominant union with a massive bark inclusion that was cracking and like opening in the wind. It's like, we should probably look at removing this tree. And then right. the conversation like maybe the client is, and the, where do and we the go? business owner I already talked about it. And she's like, I don't want to lose go. this tree. And then they're like, okay, yeah, sure. We'll keep it. We'll 100%. just prune off this uh, giant dead limb over here. Yep. But not realize there's something else. And then exactly. well, maybe the plan exactly. changes while you're in the tree. Like you, yep. you're still planning to just prune it, but oh boy, you got to come down and have that conversation. So it's yep. valuable for you to be able to recognize that because you're old, you're the only person in the tree for one. Yeah. And they, they sort of do rely on that knowledge. And I don't, we'll get into, uh, you know, how you charge for this kind of thing too, but obviously there's a spectrum of value in different contract climbers not just for speed and efficiency because i mean 90 percent of the jobs maybe you can have a fast climber just come in and mow stuff down mm -hmm. but there's also a value in all those other things like you were talking about identifying this kind of stuff and preventing a lot of problems like maybe injury or risk to failure um which i mean it, it should cost more to have that type of climber on the site if they're going to mm -hmm. provide those leadership and all these extras so yeah, I, it might be hard to justify charging more for those until you can get into those positions over time. But you know, yeah. not not everyone's equal. No, and and I think you know if if to be truly a leader and not just the guy that shows up to guy or gal that shows up to climb the tree as fast as possible, sort of thing. Uh, it's exactly what you're saying is is having the ability to have those conversations and and. The reality is, I mean, we talked about a situation where you show up to prune a tree and maybe you need to remove it. Now you're you're articulating why, but it happens the other way a lot too. 
is a company comes in and they see this tree and they see a big dead leader and they see something that's like, hey, high risk, we should probably remove this tree. And you walk in and you get up there and you're like, well, you know what? If we actually make this reduction cut and reduce some weight over here and remove this dead limb and maybe we install a cable here, like the actual risk of this when we do these mitigations are, it's pretty slim, right? There's not a whole lot of risk left after that. So we could probably keep the tree. Yeah. And, and there's a lot of that that needs to happen too, right? It's not yeah. just you're the contract climber, you show up, you climb the tree and cut it down and away you go. Uh, there's a lot of education and a lot of of kind of back and forth dialogue that can happen as well, which really does kind of put you ahead of, of a lot of the folks. So yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned back that to it, making, making your point right is, is round out that education and that experience with, with these other areas. So yeah. And of course you can get started in, in this kind of career and, and learn as you go to a degree, but there is a minimum sort of amount that you probably need, like we we already discussed to get into it, but mm -hmm. your job doesn't end there. I mean, inevitably, Never. you're going to gain that gain more experience. But I would also be seeking out ways to gain more experience and continue to learn because, you know, once you've made it, it's I don't think it's a great mindset to keep it to all of a sudden close off and just just maintain status quo. Yeah, in my opinion. But um, so we will bounce around a little bit here because we're kind of already on the topic. But um, what is a general experience level of a crew? I mean, that hires you, I guess I could expect anything from, you know, a couple landscapers mowing lawns that come across a small tree removal that are quick enough to think, hey, maybe we can get this job and we'll just hire a contract climber because they know a guy or, or they, it just mm -hmm. came to them. Or you could have, you know, really experienced tree companies with excellent climbers and educated people but maybe they're they're more now the business owners doing quotes and they're just too busy and they're they're hiring you to come in production wise and they need you for that value like is it all over the range or what what would you expect 100% yeah it is it is truly a range as far as as the experience level of the folks i mean there's some companies that i come in and they have two or three other climbers on staff and it's literally just a production thing maybe there's eight trees in this you know acreage that all need to come down they're all climbers because okay. of a power line or whatever and it's like hey we just need extra hands so they're up climbing as well and you're so just they there could to be the leaders production. on the on the site too and they're just like here john we need you to do these do these yep let us know when you're done like you're not the one showing up to rescue everyone all the no, time like we've been nope. kind of implying you're just yep yep there's a lot of times where you show up with experienced crew and you're just there to assist in production right and, and efficiency um but you range from there all the way down to folks that have never put a harness on before. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, we talk a lot and, and, you know, maybe the, the secret, the elephant in the room that nobody wants to acknowledge and maybe we shouldn't talk about. But the reality is when you're working in a contract climbing environment, there's times when you're working with a junior crew that has zero experience. They might be landscapers. Maybe they're grounds people that are halfway decent at running ropes, but just have no desire to get into a tree. You're kind of by yourself in that situation, right? Do you think that's more often than not, that's the situation for contract climbers like to expect? Yeah, I think I'm kind of lucky in my environment where there's typically somebody on site that has some level of climbing experience. It may not be, you know, super crazy high end rescue, but I can use systems and I can acquaint them with what I'm doing to the point where if something were to happen, I'm confident that they'd be able to help me out kind of thing. Uh, there are certainly times where that's not the case. And, and you can select systems that are going to allow you to affect some sort of assistance from your ground crew. I mean, it's you might decide to work a tree SRS that day with a basal anchor that goes into a rig so that you can... It's pretty easy to train a ground crew how to undo a couple half hitches and lower on a rig, right? Mm -hmm. So as long as I can undo my lanyard, in theory, they can lower me out. Right. Um, Maybe that tree that particular day has a ton of redirects and all sorts of crazy stuff. That's not an option. So yeah. there's 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 definitely it's not just show up and use you know the same climbing system, the same method that you use every single time. There's some adaptation that needs to happen based on the experience level of the crew, both from a climbing perspective and from a rigging perspective. 
It's, it's, I can't show up on a job site and start doing super technical high end rigging with multiple ropes and multiple different, you know, friction points and, and rigging points. If the crew on the ground is can't only familiar you. with square rigging, right? Yeah. So it's, I can and, educate and we can have yeah. those conversations, but at the end of the day, we can't spend an eight hour day educating. We do have to get the tree down. Yeah. Um, and we're going to get into that in episode three. That's mm-hmm. uh, one of the big things I want to talk about too, is uh, showing up and feeling like you are kind of solo and how you're going to protect yourself and work with that crew, choose those systems, that sort of thing. 100%. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, that also makes me think about, you know, myself, uh, most of the time when, as I've grew my business, I was working alone. Um, so I did find myself in these situations, climbing trees and, and rigging them out. And I had to learn ways to do this all independently without a ground crew. Yeah. You know, and looking back, it's like, why didn't I find some help? But the reality is there are, there are people out there independently doing this, or if they are working with a guy on the ground who has no idea, maybe it's his first day. Maybe he's just never been in that situation. He's scared, but you kind of have to almost build in those redundancies, which, uh, it's a great permaculture principle, but, uh, you know, having a way to do something yourself in the tree, but also have a backup for somebody else or, 100%. you know, a way to solve that, solve that problem if you need to. Yep. Yep. Um, so we could talk about some equipment maybe here. Mm-hmm. What, uh, what would you need, do you think, as a minimum to get started as a contract climber? There's the obvious, you need a vehicle. <laughs> well, need, I guess you, you could take public transit. Vehicle. Well, you but... could, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> you need a I way mean, to get to work. Yeah, it, it depends on, and, and again, I mean, this is, this is going to be so location specific. It's dependent on the species of trees you have. Do you have a lot of, you know, coniferous trees? Do you have a lot of massive canopy trees? What do you have? Right. Yeah. Uh, and so for just raw basics, uh, obviously your climbing kit, uh, have a couple options for climbing systems, kind of like we mentioned, and we can get into this in, in, in the third episode of, of the series, but having a variety of climbing systems that you're confident and capable with will allow you to adapt right. to what's going on in the environment. Like climbing spars versus totally. yeah, maybe yep. accessing a tree through a, a stationary rope system, but maybe Bingo. bringing up a second system, an MRS totally. to yep. limb yep. walk or yep. have options basically is, is what I think we're getting at. Yep. Um, you don't want to be having only one way to do things when you're going to be a contract climber, you got to be able to come exactly. and solve the problem. Bingo. Exactly. Okay. So multiple climbing systems, a harness, obviously yep. you're going to need spurs. Yep. Yeah. I mean the basics for, PPE. for kind of climbing your PPE, your spurs, stuff like that. When I say multiple climbing systems, like it's, it's, if you open my truck right now, I've probably got almost every climbing system that exists in our bar culture. And that's not because I have to have that to be a contract climber. <laughs> Cause you're a gear it's, nerd. <laughs> I, I am a gear nerd. Yes, you are correct. But I also instruct on this stuff, right? Yeah. So t- to me, there's there's a a secondary side of the, the climbing systems part of view where it's like, if I'm going to be in a course with students and people are going to bring this in and ask me questions about it, yeah. I at least want to be knowledgeable on it. I may not know the minute details. I may have to direct them to somewhere or I may have contacts that I can ask to get the answer but I at least want to be capable with every system so that I can answer questions. Uh, and so you certainly don't need to have every climbing system out there. When I say multiple climbing systems, I mean, you know, things that allow you understand MRS, understand SRS, understand yeah. how to work a spar on SRS, understand how to work a spar on MRS, these types of things, right? Understand basal anchors and how I can make a basal anchor both anchors, lowerable yeah. or rescuable, depending on how you tie it. Uh, understand these types of, of multiple systems. Don't just know that every single time I get in a tree, I'm going to choke with, you know, this particular choking method and that's all I use. I don't do anything else. Uh, it's, it's having the ability to branch out into other systems so that you can solve the problem. Um, okay, so specifically, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I'm, you're already making me think about, uh, you know, where this equipment's coming from. Of course you're mm-hmm. loaded up with the, the gear that you want to use, um, you know, I'm not thinking like liability sake, although I guess that could be a bit of a concern, but where does the line get drawn as far as what you need to provide and use versus what you could use from 
the original crew. I would assume you probably have all of your own equipment because you inspect it yourself. You want to yep. be safe. You want to know how to use it. And you probably have redundancies in your equipment that's backup or can be used with different ropes, uh, backup Correct. ropes, ropes with different devices, all that kind of stuff. So you can be fluid and flexible, which is also what I would recommend. But do you ever, would you ever recommend anyone relying on any equipment from a principal contractor? Like, I guess if you I, know them and you have a good yeah. relationship and they want to th pass you a rigging line, it's like... Yep. Yeah. I, I don't know if... I wouldn't necessarily rely on it. Uh, I mean, part of part of the business model is is you show up with all the gear to do the job, you're good fully go. self-sufficient, you're good to go. Uh, that's kind of the business model, right? Yep. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly times where I show up with uh, a crew that I've worked a lot with. I know what they have in their vehicle for rigging. I know what their rigging lines are. And we may use some of their gear to do this joint supplemented sort of problem solving. Yeah. Um, have the ability to solve the problem with your gear strictly like on your own kind of thing if if you decide if the company's there and they've already got rig lines out they've got a block out they've got those types of things and you want to utilize some of that that's great that's fine uh, ultimately at the end of the day you mentioned the term liability and when i show up and i get up into the tree and i take over as far as i'm concerned that's now on me if yeah. i'm the one that causes this branch to fall on this solarium and smash it it's coming through my insurance, not necessarily the customers or the yeah. Clients that all comes right? up after the fact, right? Like this Bingo. reminds me of fire rescue. Is like you show up and it's like nope, tear everything down that set up already. We use only our stuff. Yeah, yeah. And it's probably for the yeah for the safety aspect of it and yep. and yep. liability, right? Yeah. I mean, like you say, I inspect all my stuff. I know that my stuff is compatible with all my different ropes and all the different things that I use. I've I've structured my gear cache, if you will, around that mm -hmm. principle. Uh, so a lot of times it's just, you know what, let's just grab my stuff. I've, I've laid, you mentioned the truck. I've laid my truck out in a way that I can from, you know, a hundred feet up, I can call down and say, go into this door and this compartment. And that's where it is. So people can so grab. So what do you run for, and, for a setup? Well, I'm, I'm running well, a Tacoma. Sort of know. Yeah. yeah. I'm, Toyota I'm Tacoma. running, I'm Sweet. running a Toyota Tacoma. I love the Toyota Tacoma. Uh, it's a little too small, I will say. You can get away with a quarter ton pickup truck. Uh, it's a little too small. And it's too small for me strictly because I don't need to carry all of the stuff that I carry in my truck. I really don't. I could streamline my operation. Um, but one of the things I like about having kind of the plethora of gear that I have is I don't have to think in advance about a job. And I don't have to alter... A lot of times you're going to get on site and that's the first time you're seeing the tree. You may yeah. get a you may get a picture sent to you, but we all know, I mean certainly you understand from quoting tree work, doing it by a picture is never accurate. It's always bigger or smaller or different it's always than what bigger. you see in the picture, right? <laughs> So I was going to bring that up, I think, picture. in the future, too, about quoting and preparing totally. for the tree. But, uh, yeah. We'll get, yeah, we'll get to that again. But Yeah. A lot okay, of times so... you show up, that's the first time you see the tree. Yeah. And so it's, it's to me, I like having all of my equipment so that I can create the unique rigging situation that's going to best solve that tree in the most efficient manner. Me, too. I like having the, the truck set guessing. up, all the tools there. Yeah, so you, it's, it's good to go. It's easy to use. It's not like, oh, I have to go back home and get this to do it properly. And then you're like, oh, I don't want to drive all the way home and waste money. And then exactly. they're pissed off. Yep. It's like, just be set up and ready to go. Do you think exactly. someone could get away with like a, you know, a hatchback small car if that's all they got with something like this? You could. Yeah. I mean, it depends on your business model, right? Uh, if you're... If you're looking to be the, the person that comes in and aids in efficiency or aids in production, uh, I know a ton of people that show up with their climbing kit and their rope and a block and a rigging rope in the back of their hatchback, and they do really well at it. Yeah. Uh, and it's there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, certainly, honestly, and, you know, it's it's I keep talking about gear and solving problems and all this stuff. You can solve pretty much any problem with, with the basics, right? A rigging block, maybe a friction ring, and a couple rigging ropes. You can pretty much solve every tree. There there might be 
slightly more efficient or, or, you know, more controlled methods that you can utilize with more gear, winches, GRCS, all these other types of things. Yeah. But I mean, for the most part, you can solve 90% of tree problems with a rigging block, maybe a friction ring, you know, an omni block for a redirect and a couple rigging ropes. Like you don't need to have this massive elaborate gear cache that you can pull from. Yeah, um, and you can build on it as you go and as you yeah. I guess find some some flavors in your uh in your technique that you prefer that works Bingo. well for you, then you can yep. sort of specialize. So um so we got a we got some climbing ropes, some climbing systems. We got uh, like some slings, obviously for anchoring bottom of the tree, basal anchors. Yep. Maybe for creating some anchors elsewhere to uh, mm -hmm. help support a tree, to maybe to bring it down with ropes. Maybe you're not climbing again, like we're saying. Um, we got our blocks yep. up in the tree. Some we sort of friction spurs, lowering device, stuff. a porta wrap or something like that. Yeah. I mean, mostly everyone's using porta wraps, I think, but there yep. are some other unique devices out there. Um. Another good one. Well, I mean, saws. How many saws do you bring to a job? Just a climbing saw, or do you bring stuff for the ground? No, it's it's. I I typically bring a range of saws. I mean, I bring the saws I need to solve the aerial problem. So if I'm doing you know a massive cottonwood removal, I'm bringing some bigger saws uh, with me as well. But I bring Chunk the saws. Down. Yeah, I bring the saws to solve the aerial problem. Okay. And then I typically end up bringing a large saw with me strictly because nine times out of 10, you get it on the ground. And this, this, the, the company that you're contracted yeah. to is like, we don't really have a saw that big or like, can you yes, help us out with bucket like... this thing? Yeah. It's like, yeah, you know what? Boom, done. I've got a big saw away. I go, uh, if I, if it's a pruning job, then I'm just bringing a little top handle. I always have a redundancy. Yeah. So I'm bringing two top handles. Uh, I use Husky's, 540i a lot the battery operated saw so but good. i always have a backup gas saw or if i'm using the gas saw i bring the 540 as a backup like i always have a backup because the last thing you want to do is have some sort of issue with a saw and all of a sudden it's like uh do you have a saw i can use yeah or you mess the chain up and you don't want to sit there and charge them for sharpening your chain bingo you're 100%. like you always want to yep. be able to be, you want to be efficient yeah yeah which makes you better you know you're going to get better word of mouth too of your efficiency and that kind of thing too. You're going to get more jobs. Yeah. And when you're prepared for other things, like having a big saw there for when the tree comes down, you know, maybe your original agreement was like, they just want, they want to save money and make it as cheap as possible. But then they see you perform and you get down and they're left with all of this wood and how much work it's going to be, you know, like we all kind of see after it comes down and it's like, oh crap, we're going to be here forever. And when our saw is not big enough, 100%. well, now you might've created some more opportunity for yourself to earn some more money and expand on your business model a bit and, just help buck up this massive trunk with your sweet saw and uh, you've earned a couple hours more more pay. Yep. Well, and the reality of that is, is especially with some of the ground crews and stuff like that, again, you're finding those opportunities to mentor and educate, right? Because it's like they're watching what you're doing. You know, you're wrapping your thumb and you're being ergonomic with how you're handling the saw. And all of a sudden this like, you know, you see on... Again, nothing against any particular person, but you see these folks that are like, yeah, we're going to stand up. We're never going to take a knee. And then all of a sudden you take a knee and you're like the mentor, the guy they're looking yeah. up to. They're like, oh, oh you can okay. cut from your knees. Totally. It's it's you introducing never. these concepts and then that yeah. after they ask questions. Why are you doing that? And you're like, well, let me talk about this. Why are you putting that wedge in that log? Well, guess what? It opens up the kerf. It prevents pinching of the bar, but it also lifts the log up off the ground so I can cut yeah. through without hitting the dirt. And that's great Stuff experience like that, right? for, uh, you know, for leadership and learning how to teach and instruct. And ultimately, people that are probably doing contract climbing eventually may transition into diversifying into being an instructor like yourself. 100%. And why not get paid for your knowledge? Don't even have to bend over and cut and do anything when you can have guys asking you questions and earn money just telling them what to do sure I love it. yeah i yeah. love it it 100%. all it all leads to something else so there's always something yeah. good to find in all those experiences i think yeah so yeah. uh okay well then let's talk about a few specialty <laughs> items um well maybe before we get to your your homemade specialty item here um you did touch on it before and i i know it's a common problem with every industry and every situation is communication um it can it can make things extremely smooth 
um, you know, everything from just communicating with that person business wise or building a good relationship, but also on the job, keeping things safe and uh, making it efficient in the tree for, for what you're doing. How do you communicate with your crews? And I'm already thinking, you know, wireless communication in a helmet would be awesome. But if you're contract climbing for these guys, they may not have anything. Yeah. So I think, you know, there's the, the wireless communication wave has certainly hit arboriculture pretty heavy. Uh, things like, you know, the Cardo pack talks, the Senna's, all these types of units are becoming fairly prevalent in the industry. Um, so there are crews that I work with. Like I have a Senna that uh, goes onto my helmet. There's crews I work with that run Senna. We're able to mesh together and have those conversations for the crews that don't have those types of things, or maybe they're using a, a system that doesn't mesh with what I have. Uh, I actually picked up some of those Rocky talkies. Best investment that. you can make. Best Rocky investment talkies. you can make. Yeah. So it's a company that that they kind of they make these things for backcountry adventures, skiing, you know, uh, biking, climbing, oh, like all just these a types little, of like, things. Motorola, whatever. Yeah, it's like type it's things. like an it's it's like your basic FRS radio, but it's like an FRS radio on steroids. It's got 128 different channels. It's got like all this crazy stuff. They're super inexpensive. Uh, they're super durable. And honestly, I've come to really they come rely in a pair? on them. You can get them in a pair. Uh, How much are they about, do you think? You're probably, from a Canadian perspective, a little over 300 bucks for a pair. Uh, and so when you start to talk about some of the wireless things that attach yeah. to your helmet, uh, you can get two of these things for cheaper than you can get a wireless setup for your helmet. So do you have uh, to hold them in your hand independently or does it? can you hook it on with a bit of a wireless thing? These I mean, they've got they've got different like beat mics and stuff like that, but it's basically just a regular radio. Push to talk. Uh, yeah, the nice thing about it is it comes with a carabiner clip, so I just clip it to my harness. I usually wear a chest harness or some sort of suspenders to help support yeah. the load of my belt. Uh, I just clip it to there, and I can hand one to the ground crew, and now we can have that conversation back and forth. That's a great so solution. Um, mm -hmm. I guess it's not constant communication, but it's it's nope. something. And if you it's you don't want to have nothing, that's for sure. I mean, yelling is yep. will work, but uh, there could be miscommunication there, and that could Bingo. result yep. in a lot of problems, especially yep. if someone's helping you rig stuff down or or you need help. Um, I guess it also depends on everybody's unique situation, but if you're working with a company regularly like you are maybe with Rocky, Red Mountain Rigging, mm -hmm. um, I guess you just ask them and say, hey, I got a Senna. Do you guys want to get a Senna on your crew? And then yeah. they'll pay for it. I guess you could also be elite level contract climbing arborist and you could carry a second helmet and Senna, totally. although people will be sharing germs, but uh, if that's what you prefer, maybe, and yep. that's part of, you build that into your cost, then uh, you can provide clear communication. You could even sell, have that as a selling feature if you were literally having a website or something to promote yourself to try and find work that you have this communication already set up. So like they hire you, it's plug and play, like let's go. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's it's the constant communication is definitely the the kind of pinnacle of it. I mean, having the ability to just continually walk through what's going on and have that yeah. that real time communication, if you will. Um, and maybe to, you do a. Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry. What was your the point you were? Gonna I was. Just, I just had an idea come to me again. Like maybe when you set up a set up with one of these companies mm -hmm. that you've never worked for before, and they're kind of feeling you out. You meet up, you have this little consultation with them, you know, about what you do, what you can provide. And, uh, you know, you have this kind of stuff already arranged and you could almost sell it to them and explain to them that it's going to make the job way more efficient and faster and they're going to save money if they, and especially if they want to work with you more than one time. Maybe you come out mm -hmm. and you do one job without the communication and you talk about after that, if they like you, things work well, they need to invest in some communication that's going to match up with yours to do future 100%. jobs. And that could be almost yeah. like a requirement of yours for safety. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's certainly an avenue to explore that I think has a lot of merit to it. Um, even from that, I mean, you've mentioned that leadership and that mentorship on the job site coming in as that contract person, uh, having that real time communication. Yes. It's safer for me. Yes. It's safer for you, but it also provides a lot more opportunity for that mentorship and leadership. Cause now I'm, I'm better able to walk through the entire thought process 
as I'm climbing, as I'm tying knots, as I'm rigging, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? What am I doing here? Uh, so having that that educational side of it is also a selling feature as well to have that that real time communication for sure. Yeah, and if they're on the ground and they're standing around, and you know you need to move around and navigate, maybe you're new as a contract climber and you're not 100 percent comfortable yet. You're just you're going through some of these reps and you could at least be talking it through them. Like, you know, I need to access a tree over here. I made a mistake mm -hmm. or this needs to happen. So it's going to take me 10 minutes. Yeah. You know, then they know and they're not just like, what's this guy doing? Totally. Yeah. Get rid yeah. of him. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Okay. So specialty item, um, we've alluded to it already and you've, you've been, you've helped me out of some jams with this homemade GRC, GRCS type yeah. tool. You want to tell us Knock about that off. thing? That, that thing is sweet and that would open up a yeah. lot of opportunity for, for arborists in general, not yeah. just contract climbing arborists out there, but huge tool. Yeah. Um, so essentially, I mean, GRCS is the one that everybody knows in our board culture. Uh, massive rotary drum winch that allows you the efficient ability to move from raising to lowering really quickly, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, awesome tool. Very expensive tool. Uh, there's yeah, they're nothing. like three or $4,000 Canadian. Yeah, at least, I think. I haven't looked at it in a little while now. And the idea Certainly is, I guess we should explain it, is mm -hmm. you anchor this thing to... Correct. It's made to anchor like through like a strap mechanism to a tree. And it's a winch, essentially. You're Bingo. turning a yep. mechanical advantage to yep. crank a rope. Okay. Yep. So it's 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 a rotary drum winch. They there's people that might know sailing. Uh, they're all over sailboats. They're mounted on the deck of sailboats to put halyards Can into you see and tighten just up. Got one. Totally. Like you watch. You go YouTube like yacht racing or something like that. Yeah. You're gonna see these guys cranking on these winches. Same concept. It's that applied to tree care. And so the GRCS is kind of the pinnacle, if you will, uh, as far as how it attaches, the load it can take, the efficiency. You can swap out the winch for a friction bollard. So now if I'm transitioning from, you know, some sort of static or positive rig where my rig point is above the piece and I'm winching it up, okay. now I need to transition to a negative rig. I just pull the winch up, slide the bollard in, and now I've got a friction lowering device. Um, so the GRCS what? is kind of the pinnacle. What's, I don't understand what, what that is. <laughs> so think of a, think of a Porter app, but okay. rather than having the Porter app on a sling kind of flopping around on the tree, yeah. you slide it into the same strap mechanism that the winch mounts onto. So it's and then, fixed on the tree. So then this, the rope is essentially wrapped around the, the GRCS. And then do you then redirect the rope like before it's hooked up under tension mm. through this friction device? So, so it's one or the other, all... right? So you would okay. you would literally take the winch drum, the actual rotary winch, you'd take it out and set it aside and slide this this bollard, essentially the porter wrap, into the strapping system. Okay. Um so it's, so it, for it's got something. some yeah. So it's got some some efficiencies from that perspective. Can you it's switch it while it's under pinnacle. tension? Like I because I'm assuming no. with the Okay. So No, if you've loaded the winch, you can't Take the so you can't out, like take a, a large overhanging poplar limb over a house, you know, anchor central in the tree, use your, your GRCS or your, or your tool to raise, essentially raise the uh, branch up to bring it more vertical. So it's up mm -hmm. and off, you know, like cutting a hinge in it. Mm -hmm. But then if you needed to set that free and then drop it and lower it, you couldn't do that under tension. Like you'd have to secure. No. You can, you can lower on the winch drum for sure. I mean, the winch drum just becomes exactly like a porter wrap, right? The more wraps you put around the drum of the porter wrap, the more friction you get and the more control you get or the heavier piece you can lower. It's the same with the winch drum. You're just, you've got wraps around the winch drum. So you lift it up and yep. then you pull it out of the cleat and you can run the rope exactly like you would with a porter wrap to lower that piece down. So you can do both with it. Uh, the only thing you shouldn't do I say shouldn't because if you know the rules you're breaking, sometimes there's some leeway, uh, but you shouldn't take big negative rigs onto a winch drum. It's not designed for that. And okay. So that's where the GRCS has the bollard that can slide in so that I can throw a top out negative rig and then I might throw in the winch to do some branches or something like that or vice versa. Okay. So how is your homemade thing different or why did you make so, this thing? 
the homemade version doesn't have a bollard that'll slide in. So I can't do negative rigging off of it. It's strictly for winching stuff up, positive rigging, if you will. Uh, gotcha. So it's limit. It's limited in that sense to the GRCS correct. for that yep. reason. Okay. Yep. It doesn't have the weight capacity of a GRCS because the GRCS can obviously take a ton more weight than the 1,800 pounds that the little homemade winch can take. Uh, so there's that side of it as well. With the environment that we work in in this area, it's pretty rare that I'm going to lift more than 1,800 pounds. Uh, if I, if there's a massive cottonwood limb, maybe I take it in two. You know, I can work around that. Right. Uh, for me, it's the functionality of having something high speed, small, lightweight, etc. It's considerably smaller than a GRCS. It's easier to set up in my perspective. I just throw some ratchet straps okay. on, boom, boom, it's done. It's, it's more quick, high speed. it's efficient. 100%. Uh, but cost too, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so the particular plate that it's mounted on is actually something Neil came up with. Okay. Uh, so shout out to Neil for the Neil, homemade custom up? winch plate. He's a sailor too. He is, yeah. He understands these rotary winches and these things better than anybody out there. Uh, but yeah, so the homemade plate is something he created. And then we mounted the winch onto it, uh, and and we were able to do so much with these things that cool. you know it, it unlocks an entirely different aspect of tree rigging rather than traditional, you know, creating a series of anchor points or fish pole technique or any of these types of things. Now we can do static lifts, we can rig things into compression, we can do all sorts of crazy stuff. So, right, and maybe uh, I can touch on that from my experience mm -hmm. um, having you out because I have a you know small tree company, pickup truck, trailer. I don't use a chipper, but um, all these felling courses, all this kind of stuff. And then when I run across generally storm drops or like these hazardous trees, which is what a lot of contract climbers may get called out for. Mm -hmm. um, We've used this tool, which, yeah, like you've mentioned already, it was basically a winch attached, you know, welded to a plate. The plate was securely strapped around a, a healthy, stable anchor point tree. Uh, and then we ran the rope through, you installed a, like a redirect up high. And then we ran a rope out to uh, the house where these trees had like uprooted or broken off and fallen. And they were leaning on the house you know, and then overhanging, right? So a difficult mm -hmm. situation that some of us have been in, um, especially if you can't get access with like certain trucks or whatever it might be, or maybe you don't need them if totally. you have this tool, right? Yep. And then we would uh, hold onto the tree and then you could literally lift the tree off the house with the mechanical advantage. Bingo. And you can do this, correct me if I'm wrong, manually by putting in the the uh, handle, which is yep. you have you have two, you have like 40, is that right? 40 to one and another. <laughs> Yeah, so this, one or something? this particular winch uh, is a two-speed winch. Uh, so if I crank it one way, I get a 40 to 1 mechanical advantage. If I go the other way, I get an 18 to 1 mechanical advantage. Um, different Sweet. sized winches have different mechanical advantages, stuff like that. Um, so this yeah. particular one that I'm using is 40 to 1. And then if I go the other way, it's 18 to 1. So it's but a two-speed winch. But of course, we winch. didn't lift it. You have some crazy drill with a battery. 100%. <laughs> Tell yep. us about that thing. Well, so Harkin, I mean, Harkin is the maker of this particular rotary winch. They have an okay. adapter that goes into a drill. Uh, and so you can get like a, a Milwaukee whole hog or I partic I actually use a DeWalt VSR. It's just, you know, I didn't have any Milwaukee stuff, so I wasn't into a battery manufacturer. Uh, and I will say just total contrast. And Neil's going to argue with me a little bit on this one. Uh, I will give them the whole hog. The Milwaukee whole hog is quicker, but you get more torque out of the VSR drill. Uh, and so for me, the torque was important just because I'm lifting trees. I'm doing this type of stuff where I'm cranking trees off houses, stuff like that. So I wanted the more efficient torque. So I went with the DeWalt. But anyway, it's a big 90 degree. It's basically like a plumbing drill. It's used for drilling through joists and stuff like that and construction applications. And you put this little adapter into it from Harkin, and now I can run the winch with with the drill. So I don't have to sit there cranking things. I just, as long as I got battery power and away oh, you go. Man. And that opened up a lot of opportunities. I mean, it's just like any tool you can, yep. you could use it for multiple different applications. hundred percent. And then you can come onto site and you can judge whether, you know, it's worth it to go up and remotely set this line, fell this tree in this direction, do all this. It's like, yeah, it's not a wrong way to do it, but there might be a safer way or there might be a way that might be equally as, or more risky but it could be more efficient because I know I've done mm -hmm. some things too that are 
have more risk or danger associated to it, but it was way faster, you know? And when you're working for yourself, it's like, well, you're considering how much time that stuff's going to take. Um, and that may not, you have to judge that yourself. Obviously I'm not, I'm not, um, advocating for people to take the more risky way, but I mean, if it's still uh, a measurable amount of risk that you can accept to do something faster, maybe that's a better option. So you got to consider all of these, all of these different things. Mm -hmm. Um, one time we also used it. I thought this was great. was on these, these tall, large, uh, like rotting trees that were, you know, risky because the inside was spongy or so we suspected, or they're half dead and we needed to pull them over and we didn't want to be anywhere near the tree. Mm -hmm. So we could, um, cut a big open face notch as we would. Um, and then we would, you know, back cut or bore cut, but we would leave an extremely thick hinge on the tree, which you wouldn't normally do because it has to be obviously small enough for the tree to normally fall over or get pulled over by a rope or a five to one. But in this case, with the so much mechanical advantage, you put that notch in there, which can provide the direction in the front end of that hinge and then make our back cut however we do that. And then just crank on that thing and mm-hmm. we could, or you would even do a mismatch at the back with the bore cut. So we'd have a really big trigger, a big yep. thick trigger. Yep. So then, because I, obviously when you're doing, if people are not really following, but you know, we do a bore cut, but we don't pull the bore cut all the way out of the tree. We're leaving a strap back there. Correct. And then we, we go down maybe a few inches. And this is where the experience comes in to mismatch. Now we have this trigger that's still holding the tree, but it has to delaminate usually with a five to one or when you're away from the tree to pull it before the tree can come over, in which yep. case the hinge would have to be small enough to let the tree fall over everything. So now we can think outside the box and use this tool. We can cut, you know, a, a quote giant trigger at the back. So we're, we know for sure it's not going to accidentally release because we've probably all been there. You cut too big of a trigger and it's like, frick, it's not coming over. You gotta go back go. and cut exactly. it again. And it's under yep. tension and it's like all these extra variables. So big trigger, mechanically advantage, pull it over and then use a big hinge and still just crank it over. And then you don't have any side to side or less risk of having any side to side fade in a tree where you don't know what to expect on the inside. So it's literally 100%. made these trees safer and we're nowhere near them. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. It certainly has. I mean, it's, it's, there is a limitation to how far you can push it. I will say that, uh, we can't just go in and leave this absolutely enormous hinge and massive trigger because <laughs> if that make it holds out to be, on too you can't well, just uproot the tree, you can't just pull well, it over. What you run the risk of doing is depending, I mean, we like to install a pull rope at least two thirds of the way up the tree, right? So you get a pull rope two thirds of the way up the tree and I start cranking it. I could introduce a hell of a lot of leverage and bending moment. And now the tree fails up high and falls in a weird way. Mm. So you, there, you, you can't just yep. go to the moon with this thing. But to your point, when you do have a very rotted interior to the tree that's maybe caused a lot of that wood to be either completely disintegrated or it's really punky and is not going to give you any amount of hinge or holding wood, I can increase the thickness of things to increase the amount of holding wood I have so that you're right, the tree yeah. doesn't decide to go sideways onto a house or do some weird stuff. So it does give you the opportunity to create a slightly safer environment. Whereas if I'm using a traditional five to one or a nine to one or whatever, I may have to cut a little bit thinner to make sure I have the force to pull it over. So for sure. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. That's also one thing we didn't really mention. That's uh, a really handy tool. You don't need power, uh, that kind of thing. It's inexpensive as having a five to one or 100%. You know, fiddle block or mechanical advantage in your, yep. in your kit um, as a contract you climber can, as well. You can lift pieces. You can do static picks that are lifting branches up from a climbing perspective with a porter wrap and a five to one picky on top. I mean, it's, you don't need all this fancy elaborate gear. It certainly makes it more efficient and quicker, uh, but yeah. you can do it without for sure. hundred percent. Cool. Okay. Anything we didn't touch on you think as far as equipment, if we got everything, Hey, yeah, I think we probably nailed equipment, PPE pretty, tools, pretty transportation. Yep. yep. Um, how about anything on the out? I mean, I guess you need, uh, depending on how you're going to run your business. We're going to get into that into some other episodes about Mm -hmm. some more behind the scenes stuff, but that kind of brings me into a little bit of expectation versus reality. We sort of already touched on it, but is there anything major that stands out to you as to what you expected in general, you know, being a contract climber, going out there and doing these jobs as we've already been discussing versus what it's actually like? Is there any kind of, you know, extra hidden parts of this job that you did not expect, 
you know, whether it's training or administration stuff or I don't know what. Yeah, I don't. I mean, it's it's from an administration perspective. I, there's not a whole lot that happens to it. I mean, it's it's I, I know you are a jobber ambassador and you actually hooked me up into jobber as well. So from an administration standpoint, like yeah, I got a link in my bio on Instagram. <laughs> there you go. Wants to try out jobber software <laughs> plug for you. Uh, but I mean, it's it's from an administration perspective. It's it's super simple from that regard. Um, I don't know. I think the biggest the biggest thing that I didn't necessarily expect was probably the level of contact I still get to have with people. And and I really enjoy that level of contact. I love educating homeowners. Uh, mm. For a period of time when I was kind of running a small tree service, that was kind of the biggest thing that I enjoyed doing was connecting with the community and putting posts out there and educating people and going out and having yeah. conversations about their trees and their yard, blah, 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 blah. I really enjoy that contact. And I guess when I transitioned over to contract climbing, that was one of my biggest fears was losing that. And, and my expectation was I wasn't going to have that anymore and I was going to yeah. have to find other ways to fulfill that. Uh, and, and the reality that I found is you still actually get a lot of communication with homeowners, with you know new communication avenues through the crew that's on site with you. Um, that was a big one for me. Okay. And so I think it's, it's if you want to truly be efficient as a contract climber and, and kind of create the change in the industry that I think all of us are, are interested in creating – it's it's having the ability to still communicate with people. It's not just you show up and you cut and and you know I I've heard stories from some of the crews I work with of contract climbers that show up and they don't talk to them. They just like they yell at them yeah. all day. They get it on the ground. They're like peace, see you later. Uh, I think the reality is that I've found is the more personable you are, the more you can connect with people. And frankly, yeah. I mean the the. The concept out there that a contract climber never picks up a rake is certainly reality. That I, I, the first person to pick up a rake. If the owner's sitting there going like, "No, you cost too much. You need to leave." Fine, yep. I'll leave. <laughs> but when I get down, yeah, you're I throw my gear help, in my yeah. bag. I put it in my truck and I grab a rake, or I'm pulling branches, or I'm doing what I can, and that goes a huge way into into building that reputation and that that relationship with your customers and your ground crews and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the expectation of you show up, you're the ninja guy. I don't. There's that uh, that video that's going around. It's been on social media. It's from a TV show. Oh yeah, I think Eduardo, I know. the contract climber that shows up. Uh, it's like oh, you know, that, it's, it's, there's this like there's aspect of of expectation towards it, but the reality is is the more you can integrate as part of the crew and just be the the guy that just meshes with everybody and has those conversations and relates with people, the better off your, your business yeah, model is going to be. I think you, uh, obviously like anything, you get out of it what you put into it. Yep. So if your intention and your desires and everything that drives you, you know, to be this entrepreneur, this contract climber, this person that wants to connect with people, then that's what you're going to get out of your job and your life and whatever. You want those things. You're going to make an effort to do that and uh, whatever. The universe is going to give it back to you if you want to get all woo-woo. But there's nothing, I think, wrong with uh, you know people also being a contract climber. Maybe they're attracted to it because they don't like that interaction. And I always find this funny because people talk about like, oh, it's the worst part of your job. And it's like, oh, it's dealing with people. Oh, I hate the people. And then you ask the same people or maybe other people later and it's like, what was the best part of your day or best part of your job? Oh, it wasn't, you know, climbing that tree that day. It was actually interacting with the people, yeah. you know, and having those good interactions. So it's, again, it's a mindset and it's how you look at things. But I think overall in general, human interaction is, is positive. And it's, it's amazing, obviously, too, when you can solve problems with these people or you can overcome a bit of conflict with them and make them happy in the end. And it's like, it feels so good. Like I recently had a job out in, in uh where you're when you're neck of the woods there redwood meadows for that mm -hmm. for that job and things kind of went yep. sour for miscommunication towards the end and whatever but you know we we were open and honest and then had some better communication as these problems came up and then it left feeling really good like everyone felt awesome and it was like it was like the worst part of my day and the best part of my day at the same yeah. time you know and uh really in the end it's about making making people happy making your your con principal contractor happy and the homeowner happy and Bingo. and whatever but um getting back to that point 
I think you can be, you know, if you are a bit of an introvert and you just prefer not to have that interaction, contract climbing could probably provide you with that, especially if you work with maybe a crew where they're, you know, at least there has to be somebody kind of in charge as a bit of a leader and point of contact, you mm-hmm. know, on site, but maybe you align yourself with a company that already has that sort of in place and you're not yeah. then expected to, to have these relationships or, or talk. You can kind of still come in and kind of work behind the scenes, mm-hmm. but you know, ultimately I think interaction is inevitable and uh, why not make it positive? Yeah. I mean, the reality I think of, of, the environment is whether or not you've got that leadership figure on site and you're just coming in for production help, you are still looked at as a leader, as the, the specialist that's coming in either for efficiency, productivity, technical rigging, knowledge of how this tree is, needs to be supported, cabled, all these types of things. Uh, There's still, there is an expectation that you have some level of leadership within that crew and within the industry. Uh, and, and you need to be knowledgeable and you need to have the ability to more or less take charge and communicate okay. and, and not necessarily bark orders at people and yell at people and say, we're doing this, you do that, do that. Like it's, it's the ability to communicate with people is key. Uh, yes. And it's, it's and that can come from any job and any experience in your life day to day working yeah. on those things. You can get those 100%. skills Bingo. without being an arborist. Exactly. Exactly. So. And, I got those skills from a completely different industry, frankly, mm-hmm. uh, and I've just brought it over towards our board culture. Me too. I thought there'd be no transferable skills from some of my previous work, but it was insane yep. how much just communication and interaction, understanding people, how they think. Bingo. Put yourself into their shoes is what I would recommend to anyone who's trying to work on this kind of thing. Think about uh, things through their lens if you can. You know, exactly. wherever they might be at, they could. Yep. They could be a really stubborn, you know, grouchy old man or woman or you know they could be another entrepreneur a young yeah. person they just gotta like, think what experiences they have in life and where they're kind of coming from and no one intentionally is is trying to do bad or harm on anyone else they're all everyone's doing their best to a degree yep. it may not be how you think and how you align but sure the reality is we all started somewhere right we all started somewhere with base knowledge level zero and and not necessarily to just assume that everybody you're working with has zero knowledge but again, what you're saying to drive home that point is put yourself in their shoes. Understand that at one point you had no idea what you were about to do. And you don't right? know what you don't know yet. Exactly. So put yourself in their shoes. Understand that this was new to me at one point. So I'm going to do the due diligence and explain this to this person. So now they understand the concept. They might understand some of the physics, why we're doing it this particular way and everybody's knowledge level increases and that's what's important with it that's that's really the key takeaway to all of this is is you really do the whole purpose of the contract climber is yeah fine efficiency productivity all that kind of stuff but the 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 main purpose and a big reason why customers bring in contract climbers is to help educate their crew and to help introduce new concepts that they just don't understand yeah buddy so i love having that. the ability to communicate to people is key yeah it's all about pulling back the why and the layers. I always, I think about this with everything myself. Yep. I contemplate all sorts of things all the time. <laughs> Keeps my brain <laughs> going hard, but um, there's like different levels of zoom of how you can look at things. It's like, yeah, on a very surface level, you're there to cut a tree down. Yeah. And then you zoom out and it's like, no, but you're cutting a tree down because there's a safety problem. And, and then these guys don't know what to do. So now you're looking at it as a leader and then you can zoom out even further. And it's like, you're there ultimately to make these people happy so they can earn money so they can go home and spend on their families and have a kid. So then the further back you go, it's all about just being happy. Totally. You know, when you, when you peel it back far enough. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's bring it back to reality here. And, uh, (laughs) Let me know what do you what do you do. So if you say you're new and you're thinking about jumping into this, um, you've got a job. You're talking to a, to a business owner that wants to hire you as a contract climber. Mm-hmm. Generally, from your experience or someone in general, what should they start out with as far as their responsibilities versus the crew? Like, should they define that clearly before they get there, and what should that look like? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely defining the job scope and what the expectations are is is key. Uh, there's certain 
like we kind of talked about it earlier, there's certain companies that want you to get up in the tree, get it on the ground and walk away and that's it. They don't want anything else. There's some customers I work with, they want start to finish. They want you to help with the cleanup because they're, they've only got one crew or something like that. Uh, so certainly defining the job scope is is pretty key. You're walking on the job site, figure out what that looks like. And honestly, you mentioned it as well. Like have those conversations with people before the time comes for you to show up on site and do a job for them. Yeah, maybe not a good build idea for them just to phone you up and be like, hey, I heard you contract climb. Can yeah. you show Come up on this job out. on Saturday? Which I'm totally. sure probably happens quite often. Yep, it does. Or maybe it's yep. like, hey, can we have a little video chat at least or meet up? Yep. And sometimes that meetup is on the job site with the company owner before he takes off and continues to do quotes or she takes off or whatever the case may be. Uh, yeah. But the reality is there that conversation about the job scope and their expectations of you is is pretty key because it's it's I can be adaptable, but I just need to understand what are you expecting out of today? What are you expecting out of me? Do you want me to just cut this down? You know, where are we going with this? Um, because that also leads into some of the experience levels. You can start to ask, well, what is your normal workflow? Oh, we prune trees all the time. Great. So removals are new. Got it. We're working with a crew that's fairly green with rigging. Understand. Uh, you can start to have those conversations to build your mindset about how you're going to manage that job. Uh, yeah. But certainly that communication is key. To understand the job scope right off the bat and and, and being a bit there. fluid and flexible, because I know I've been in situations too where it's like, no, yeah. our guys can do this. You just do that. And then next thing you know, the owner's gone and you look over and it's like someone's one-handing a saw, not wearing chainsaw pants. And you're like, I know you guys said you could do this, but so then you got to sort of intervene. Yeah. You know, and then it's like, <laughs> I don't know. If things are unsafe, obviously you're going to intervene, but there's probably this gray area too where it's like, how much do I take away from what I'm supposed to be doing here to try and improve things on their end. Cause I'm sure you probably see things constantly that could be improved upon. Hence the reason the leader's not there anymore and you're sent in to do the technical work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so as I guess, yeah. Anyways, we're probably going to touch on that more in the other episodes. Um, yep. But as far as getting back to debris, I mean, that's probably a common question for people that are new that are getting into this. We kind of touched on it a little bit. Obviously, you bring us all along to be prepared for larger trees. You never know. Maybe a new tree gets added to the job. Who knows? Or you need to help them. Their saws fail. You can help buck up the tree. Um, but I guess you would define that before you get there. You know, if you're just going to dismantle and then get to the ground and they're going to cut down the spar or you're going to help cut down the spar, whether you're going to buck it up into firewood cut those firewood rounds, you know, in quarters because it's so big. Yep. I don't know. But it's probably good to have a bit of a roadmap as to, as to what to do. And then uh, as far as cleanup goes, I mean, do you just start cleaning up? Do you offer to clean up or do you, like, how do you yeah, work with them to know when you, when you should leave? So you're not just like, peace. Yeah, it's 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 part of that conversation um, that happens between you and, and the company that's hiring you or the ground crew or whatever the case may be. Because the reality is uh, you need to work within the confines of what that hiring company expects, right? If they don't want you to help with cleanup because their ground crew can handle it or whatever the case may be, then then that's the reality of it. So I, I, I'm i not the type of person to try and milk money out of a company. Um, right, yeah. I always kind of offer, like right during the initial conversation, like, Kent, we need your help to get this tree down. Excellent, sounds good what's the reasoning? What's the crew? You know, how are we doing this? What are your expectations? What's the job scope? And then I always ask, are you handling cleanup or would you like some assistance? I always just put that out there. Yeah. Um, they understand the rates. They understand how that works. Nine times out of 10, they're like, you know what? If you can help us get this stuff from the backyard to the front yard or do whatever, like our guys can throw it through the chipper. Uh, but just if you don't mind assisting getting some of that out and they'll do the final rake, it's like, okay. great, perfect. That's fun. That's I'm totally okay with that. Um, because again, it's that opportunity to interact with people and build relationships and, and get to know the ground crew a little bit better. And, and, and it all builds towards, you know, if, if I'm personable with the ground crew and I help them out when I, when, if something happens, they know me, we have that personal relationship. They're more invested in helping me out. Right. Yeah. So it's it's all totally self serving, but yeah. Uh, okay, well, no, it's it's all part of that conversation about job for sure. Scope, so for communication sure. again, huge. Yep. 
Um, just to kind of wrap it up, it's been great, by the way. Mm. Um, maybe give us an outlook for someone who's just knowing, not knowing what to expect here of a usual day-to-day experience, you know, wake up till you go to bed type thing, start to finish. Mm-hmm. on like an easy kind of regular day as a contract climbing arborist versus like your most challenging days and what that looks like like what kind of problems are you facing yeah i think it's it's as far as kind of the the regular day if you will i mean it's it's typically it's great if you can book things out and a lot of times if people have a tree that's like, you know, we've looked at it and we know we're going to need assistance with that. You can book it two, three, whatever you need to do, book that in advance. Okay. A lot of times it's it's the day before they give you a call. They're like, whoa, we got this tree. Can you help us? Oh, okay. Uh, so more, okay. Yeah. It's a lot of, a lot of it is, is last minute, especially during busy season. Hmm. And so, I mean, when we talk about expectations and reality of contract climbing, uh, as a contract climber, through the busy season, I I know that I'm just going to be like any They're given day. I'm probably gone from sun up to sundown. Like that's just book, the reality of it. Do you self book maybe like a Monday, Wednesday, Friday for pre planned jobs, or yep. maybe for half days, and then leave other ones open? So it's like, Bingo. oh, I can't come today, but I can come tomorrow because I left yep. it open. Yep. Yeah, I try and and if there's flexibility, if I get enough leeway and there's some flexibility and dates that we can work with that that company, I try and and schedule things so that I leave openings for for other stuff. But uh, the reality is you're basically like, just know that you're the person, right? And and a lot of times that's kind of the allure, right? Like all of a sudden mm-hmm. you're the guy that gets to swoop in and solve the problem and be the hero and all that kind of stuff. So um, it's kind of the draw to it sometimes. But so, I mean, you wake up in the morning and, and just like any other you know, business owner, you're looking at the schedule, you're figuring out what you're going to. And if you've got enough advanced leeway and maybe you've seen the tree, maybe you're you're finessing the gear uh, layout that you're bringing to the job, stuff like that. Maybe if you're new, you've planned it ahead of time and you've yep. taken your own initiative to go and look at the tree in person to have a plan before you Bingo. get there. Exactly. Yep. I like to be one of the first people on the job site simply so that when that crew that. shows up. Good idea. Lines are set in the tree, porter wraps are tied on the base, winch is tied in, like everything is ready to go so that when the crew shows up, we do a briefing, we do our FLHA, we do our little safety talk, and we're up in the tree. Um, And you're not fumbling. I mean, it's so annoying uh, fumbling with some of that equipment when you're trying to get it set up because it can take longer some days. Totally. Yeah. There's... (laughs) We've you all had want... the throw line blues, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's the last so it's nice thing get you want is to be out of the way. Bingo! The last okay. thing you want is to be sitting around on site with everybody else waiting because now they've got the chipper set up, everything's ready to go, but you haven't been able to get into the tree yet because you're struggling with a throw line. Or, yeah, you know, so if Murphy is arrive early, an in hour full force to. today. Yeah. Do you charge so like for that be... hour, or do you like do you go earlier than what say your expected time is so you can no. be prepped, or do you? Add up your no, hours. I, I have that conversation with with the customer. Okay. Uh, with with the company that's bringing me in, I say, hey, this is how I like to work my my day. This is how okay. I do my workflow. If your folks are arriving at eight a.m., I'm going to be on site for seven thirty, just so you're okay with that and you understand that, so that I can set my lines, I can do all the things, I can have the rigging set gotcha. up at the base of the tree. They show up. I'm on rope and I'm in the tree so that they're being efficient as well. They're not waiting around. Okay. And when you when you have that communication up front, the owners are like, well, yeah, of course, that makes total sense. Why would I have my crew waiting around for you to set a line in a tree, right? Yeah. And then, uh, sorry to cut you off, but episode mm-hmm. three, we're going to talk about that phase of when they arrive. Mm-hmm. You know, before you go up in the tree, obviously, there's a lot of introductions, some safety talk, maybe writing yep. down some stuff on paper just to get prepped, to set you up for success. Um, but 100%. we'll get into that in episode three. But I imagine you go through those those steps and processes as well before you just, you know, they don't, just don't show up and you're in the tree already yelling. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So then you perform your uh, removal or removals, whatever you're doing. Do, yep. you, do you go all day or how long is this looking like? It depends on the job, right? A lot of times you're done noon, one, two o'clock. And, and again, it depends if the... The company that you're contracting to wants assistance with cleanup or bucking or whatever. So some days you've done lunchtime, one, two o'clock kind of thing. There's been days where we've gone right until the sun's going down and you're strolling home at midnight kind of thing. 
Uh, it's, it's totally dependent on the tree and, and you need to be able to have that flexibility in scheduling as well. And that's where that support system for, you know, with children, family, spouses, all that kind of stuff, the support system's huge. Uh, honestly, it's, it's can't say enough about those people that are able to kind of support you in, in doing that and making that phone call. Hey, this one's taking a while. Yeah, you gotta be Not going to be home for dinner. So arranging uh, your home, home schedule a little bit too for that. Like if you have yeah. kids that you need to be there for when they get off the bus or something like that, maybe shouldn't be jumping into a tree totally that day, yeah. especially you don't know what to expect. Uh, do you book yep. multiple jobs or do you recommend guys maybe just starting out, I guess just maybe one job a day. Cause you don't know how long it's going to go, but yeah, I mean, if, if, if you have a good understanding of what's going on and, and you're able to confidently look at this thing and then maybe it's just, you're doing it for productivity, efficiency, stuff like that. Uh, there's times when I've done a couple in a day, I've done one in the morning that I know is only going to take me two hours and then I'll cycle down to another one. Cause it was a last minute call or something like that. Uh, there's certainly opportunities to do that. Um, if it's something that requires some rigging, you get to know your ground crews and stuff like that. I tend not to try and double book because the last thing you want to do is call up that customer and be like, Hey, I'm tied up. I'm not going to make it there today when they've got their ground crew mobilized, they're heading to the site, they're doing all the stuff. Uh, so it just depends on the trees and the situation and the day. There's honestly, there's, there's no real two days that are the same. And that's kind of the excitement to me is every yeah. day is a little bit different. Right. So, but it sounds like, you know, from what we've already said here too, you can have control on the outcome of that day with preparation. 100%. So making sure obviously you're prepared, your skills are there, you're ready, you're there, you're leaving yourself enough time, you have good safe equipment, good communication is huge. And then you're making that plan and then you're working that plan as we discuss in Abor Culture Canada. Yep. If you miss some of those things, you know, you show up a little bit like, I'm just alluding now to like a hard day for someone, especially if they're new. You're nervous. Maybe you haven't met the, the company yet. That's going against you. You show up at the same time or late. Then you're struggling with throw lines, setting lines. Maybe you're not sure how what you're going to do with this tree. The crew's standing around. Maybe they're landscapers. Maybe they're, they just started day one. Or maybe you don't even see the owner on site. And they don't know what to do. You can see that they're not using proper PPE, not using chainsaws safely, that kind of thing. You're worried about them assisting you and you're going to need them maybe to help you rig something down. So then you might find yourself teaching them something brand new for the first time and you can tell they can't even tie a knot. You know, these are all potential issues that could cause a problem in the, in the later on. Uh, maybe you go up the tree, you have your own <laughs> problems with equipment or you're just not feeling good that day. You forgot to eat. Maybe you had a negative interaction with one of these guys that's not, uh, not listening or something. I don't know. Um, Maybe you come across problems in the tree actually doing your job. Hopefully not, because that's kind of what you have ultimate control over. That's, mm -hmm. that's, I know there's a lot of variables in removing the actual tree itself that we 100%. could discuss, but generally you should have a plan that you're able to do independently up there if that's what you need to do. Um, yeah, I don't know. And then maybe coming down, maybe something does happen. It's not what you expected. Maybe the Maybe the company you're working for, the owner comes back and he's pissed off that it's taking way too long. Or if sure. you're new, it could yep. take way longer than you expected. These could be a, an example of a bad day just for people mm -hmm. what they know, what they can't expect. It could be very, very challenging. hundred percent. Yeah. People, somebody could get hurt yep. or, or, or killed. I mean, at the, at the extreme, but you know, hopefully that would never happen, but yeah, well, so I to think prevent... it's, it's to prevent a lot of that, to kind of, to, to, I think, build on where you're going with that over communicate. And, and we've talked about communication a lot, but over communicate everything you're doing and everything that's happening. It's don't try and keep things to yourself because you think that you're going to try and like turn this into something that they won't realize that maybe something went a little squirrely there. Like over communicate, just be upfront and be honest with all of honest. it and, and over communicate is all I can say. Honest. They hired you. They don't know what they're doing. Yep. And I mean, I've, I've done that and it's hard to be confident, confident and, and be honest that, you know, you're facing some challenges, maybe internally, you're a bit stressed out. Maybe you, you don't know what to do in that situation. You need some time to figure it out, something, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but you're likely to come across a lot of these problems, especially in the beginning, less and less as time goes on. But being honest and transparent about that kind of thing is, is going to save you. Huge. Yep. Cool, buddy. Well, this was good. I think we touched on a lot of stuff that was. Mm -hmm. Two hours, 10 minutes, we're sitting out here. So 
I appreciate you coming on. And I'm looking forward to episode two and three here. Maybe we'll uh, look at recording those another another day. Sounds good, brother. Looking forward um, to it. Yeah, so episode two, we're going to go through, just as a little recap here, contract climbing arborist, business plan, finding work. So we're going to talk about how to set yourself up, how to get your name out there, how to find these jobs and who to work with, who to kind of pick out and why that kind of thing. Maybe different business styles, like hybrid business style, like we were discussing being mm-hmm. a contract climber, but also maybe taking on some independent jobs as well with some minimal equipment just to earn a few extra bucks and have some flexibility. I think we'll get into even some business stuff like setting up, you know, a sole proprietor versus incorporated. And of course we're not experts on that, but we can give you our experience. Bingo. Because, uh, I mean, obviously, Sean's coming back for these episodes if you haven't figured that out already. So <laughs> it's more of us. Um, yeah, and how to find contractors, how to advertise, all that kind of stuff. I love marketing, so I'm really happy to help out with some of those conversations. Uh, and then how to charge, how to make money in these in this business. Some hidden costs, different things like that. Uh, we'll get back into some transferable skills. And then episode three, it's going to be more of a lessons learned some new ideas the future i kind of have it loosely titled right now we're gonna talk about some close calls you know preparing with some of those safety meetings like literally the forms that we fill out what what you should kind of do with uh or what we would recommend at least with other guys on the on site Uh, and then i have some new ideas that i want to kind of bring up too about maybe some different ways to think about how the business could be run as a contract climbing arborist Uh, maybe doing it more in teams or having a second person there Uh, maybe how you can hybridize some of these ideas with uh, rope access some things that you've learned from diversifying or how other people can maybe even explore getting into those things so that'll be uh, episode three so i'm really looking forward to it i think it should be a good valuable value packed content for uh for everyone out there totally 100 percent. interested yeah looking forward to it it's gonna be good any anything else i mean other than uh, telling us where people can find you more is there anything else you want to add no, geez. I mean, I think we've covered all sorts of good stuff, but, uh, I mean, yeah, a biggest, biggest, I guess, takeaways is, is communication is honesty and, and open. So I, something that I kind of fall back on as kind of a motto of mine, if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. So oh, really be, oh yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. If you, <laughs> if you feel like you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Cause how can you learn? If you think you're the smartest person in the room, how are you going to learn anything from anybody else? Step so one, it's, recognize it's, that you're thinking that. Fair enough. Fair enough. And then... Yeah. I mean, that's... When it comes to contract climbing, when it comes to going down this avenue of being the guy that the folks yeah. call, the guy or the gal that, that gets called in to solve the problems, uh, try to never be... I mean, when you walk into the crew, your expertise is what's going to guide them. But you can learn something from those folks that... Maybe it's as simple as how to show somebody how to do a specific exactly. thing. Like it's learning how to communicate. Always something to learn. Exactly. Yeah. I, I have that all the time too. It's just people that help me uh, do my job. I had one guy, you know, I could show him one way and it worked really well for him. Another yep. guy, it didn't. I had to learn how to re-explain everything in a different way that this guy could get it. 100%. Just different it's, learning styles. Yeah. So it's always yeah. be open to learning something every day. Yeah. For sure. Awesome. Okay. And then, um, the Rocky, Rocky Mountain Arb, right? R O C K Y. Yeah, Rock, Rocky Mountain Arborist. Yeah, is the the handle, if you will, for is the that your Instagram. Website? And uh, yeah, website's just www.rockyarb.com or .ca. I'd have to check. And but, you're most active on Instagram, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's yeah, what's the handle again for that? Sorry. At Rocky Mountain Arborist. Okay, and I'll have these down in the uh, the captions and things too, so you can connect with Sean or uh, myself, whatever. 100%. Um, yeah. Any other contact information you want to share? Is that pretty much it? That's pretty much it. That's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, right on. there's an email on the website. If you want to go that route too, there's a phone number on the website. There's all sorts of stuff. So I'll confirm the website and you can throw it in the description, but, uh, okay. I yeah. think I have it on file here. I so can't far. remember if it's .com or .ca, but yeah, no worries. Okay. Well, I appreciate it, buddy. Right on, man. Thank, thank you so much. Okay. Deal. Sounds good. Bye everyone. See you in episode two. Oh, my God.